Well, welcome everyone. This is Bruce Belzowski. I'm the managing director of the Automotive Futures Group here in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I want to welcome you to our 13th annual uh, Inside China Automotive Conference. It's a conference that we've been uh, uh, working on since uh, the early uh, 2000s. We, it was the first conference that we, we, we did as a group and uh, it, it's an area that we've seen grow tremendously uh, since, the, since the early 2000s. I uh, want to thank everyone for uh, attending today and also want to thank our speakers in advance for the work that they've been doing to prepare for, for this conference. I'm going to start out today with a little intro to the, uh, to the conference and what the, some of the logistics of the conference. And also we'll look at some of the sales and production numbers and some, uh, some issues related to uh, consumers uh, uh, having to do with the, um, with the, with the uh, automotive industry in China. So when you look at what's going on in the the uh, automotive industries group. Uh, as I said, I'm the managing director. I'm retired from the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute. And we'll be, uh, uh, we get our affiliate funding is the, our main funding source. Uh, we have supporting members as, as well as research partners. Uh, our research focuses on globalization, powertrains and, and intelligent transportation systems. And that also leads into IT as well and we put on five annual conferences. Uh, all, we always wanna thank our affiliate members. The, these are the companies that support us and provide us with the funding that we need to put on the conferences. And we really uh, uh, look forward to working with them and, and talking to them about the things that, that are important to them. We also wanna are pleased to announce a new affiliate member, a Mazda USA has now joined our group and we look forward to working with them as well. Uh, from our research partners, we have IT organizations, uh, we also have OEMs, uh, government and NGOs, as well as the supply base and the consulting base for the automotive industry. Our, our main research projects uh, to date are looking at uh, powertrains for power, our powertrain strategies for the 21st century project, our uh, China new energy vehicle project, and uh, looking at uh, new mobility in terms of IT, technology, policy, and innovative business models. Uh, our uh, team of automotive researchers is made up primarily of students. Um, we have uh, uh, seniors, juniors, uh, looking at uh, coming from, uh, from uh, uh, economics, from, from business, from engineering, uh, from uh, and, and also from psychology. So we have a, a variety of students have been working with, uh, we're, we're working with that with us uh, for a number of years. And also our, uh, our research associate, Kara Alkire, she's online uh, today uh, monitoring the YouTube site. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, about that in just a minute. Uh, please join our LinkedIn page. Uh, many of you are already connected to us through LinkedIn, uh, but you'll get, uh, uh, more information on future events and, and, and information uh, that we're putting out uh, two to three times a week on what's going on in the automotive industry and our, our take on what's, what's going on. Some of it's promotion for the conferences, but that's also, a lot of it is uh, focusing on some of our, our research. Um, just, I think, uh, just recently we did an interview with one of our affiliates, uh, uh, Jeremy Holt from Means Industries, asking him about the work that they're doing in China and some of the, the risk and rewards uh, of that work. So it's an interesting uh, uh, interview that were uh, worthwhile for you checking out. Uh, our up next conference is in February, February 24th. Uh, here it's, uh, we're taking on a, a quote from the past, uh, never let a crisis go to waste. How will new mobility initiatives in the auto industry and in the public sphere come out of the pandemic? Uh, we, we're holding our April conference open right now. We're trying to decide exactly what we want to uh, talk about. We're thinking about maybe the role of 
the new role of government with the change in administration, how things may change in the government and its relation to the relationship to the automotive industry. And in July, we're, we're doing our, our 13th annual uh, powertrain strategies for the 21st century conference. Uh, we've got four presenters uh, with us today, uh, Chen Fu from uh, Pony AI, Michael Wang from uh, Argonne National Labs, Hong Tzu Zhu from, uh, from Didi, and uh, Sanjun Lee from uh, uh, Cornell University. I want to thank all, of, all those speakers in advance for, for joining us today. Uh, Sanjun is going to lead us off uh, it, uh, after, after I'm done. We'll do a Q&A with him, then followed by Michael in his Q&A. We'll take about a 10 minute break and then come back. I'll give you a little more insight into some of the work that we're doing on our uh, NEV project. And also, uh, and then Hong Tu is going to talk about his work with DD and, and then we'll uh, end up with uh, Chen Fu from uh, Pony AI talking about their uh, autonomous vehicle work uh, and, and adjourn at, uh, at 1230. Uh, we'll have the, all the attendees, uh, everybody who's registered, will get a link to the presentations. Uh, the website will also have the uh, this uh, version, edited version of this uh, presentation uh, uh, video, as well as the uh, the presentations from the from the speakers. Affiliates get that information, but they also get a a link to the review of the highlights of of, of the conference that. Uh, that uh, Kara specializes in. Uh, all the, the agenda, the speaker bios, registration list, sponsorship opportunities, the affiliate information, upcoming events, it's all on our Inside China website. I sent you the link to that on, uh, along with the live stream uh, link email. Uh, the audience questions and the conference feedback uh, is our forms. These, are, these links are uh, under, uh, underneath the, in the description, uh, underneath the, uh, the uh, YouTube site that you're looking at right now, uh, underneath that there's a description. If you click on more, you see the links uh, for the, uh, the Q&As. You can also do Q&As from, uh, from the chat box next to the, uh, to the presentation. Uh, Carol will pick those up and send those over to me. Uh, but you could, if you want to be more anonymous, you can use the, uh, the link for the questions that's uh, underneath the live stream. Also have a uh, conference feedback uh, link there. We'll be sending that to you again after the conference to, to get some more information about uh, how you think things are going in terms of the conference. Uh, when you look at what's going on in the, what has gone on and what's going on in the Chinese automotive industry, uh, we really divide the industry into uh, three groups. Uh, there are the joint venture manufacturers, and these are the, uh, uh, the groups uh, GAC, BAIC, SAIC, along with their foreign partners. Um, the joint venture joint venture companies also have their own brands uh, that, they're, that they also sell. And then they're the independent domestic manufacturers. And there's one subgroup of uh, Tesla and Honda. Uh, Tesla, because they made a uh, deal with the uh, Chinese government when they first set up uh, in China very recently, uh, that they did not need a joint venture partner. And Honda, because they're the, the plant, one of the plants that they have uh, is for export only. So these are the, how we've been, uh, how we divide up the, the uh, Chinese automotive industry. Um, so we look at the main uh, joint venture groups, the GAC group with Fiat, Honda, Toyota, and as you can see, all the other uh, major global manufacturers along with their uh, Chinese counterparts. From the domestic brands, uh, these, are, um, these are the main independent domestic brands. They do not have uh, foreign joint ventures. And so these are uh, a little more, uh, in, have to be a little more innovative uh, in terms of how, they're, how they run their businesses. Uh, some of the companies have actually gone out and purchased uh, global brands such as Geely, which now owns uh, uh, Volvo. Uh, and, also, and then there's a new wave of emerging independent Chinese EV manufacturers. There's NIO, there's Li Automotive and Xpeng Motors. 
and uh, all of these companies are, are very relatively new on, on the scene. Uh, uh, but we'll have some more to talk about them uh, in, in, in the near future. When you look at what's, what has gone on in China in terms of uh, light duty uh, vehicles and, and commercial vehicle sales from 2008 to 2019, you can see the, the tremendous growth that, that we've been following uh, from the 9 million vehicles that we saw back in 2008 to the 28, 29 million vehicles that topped out in 2017. And, the, um, and what we see a bit of a de decrease, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, in 2018 and, and 2019, but uh, in terms of growth rate is definitely a decrease. But when you look at uh, 25 million vehicles uh, compared to the, the, the amount that the US puts out at a, at a good year of about 17 million, uh, you can see that why, why we're following the Chinese market. Uh, if you look at what's going on this year, um, uh, as you can see the effects of the pandemic in, in February uh, and March, but you see some pretty steady uh, recovery from uh, in April through, through uh, September and October. Um, we've got some, uh, a bit of a decrease from October, from, from September to October, but still uh, these are, are, are pretty good numbers in terms of our recovery. They will not meet what, they, what the numbers that we saw for, from last year because of the uh, uh, tremendous decrease that took place in February, March, but it will not be uh, as great a decrease as, as many had expected. Let's take a quick look at what we've been looking at. We look at the different brands. We've looked at the sales in, in China. Um, we've looked at what's been going on in uh, 2018, 2019, uh, how that's changed over time. We looked at what's going on in 2020. And uh, when you look at the breakdown of the, the, the Chinese total vehicle uh, production from uh, 2018 and 2019, it's uh, primarily uh, uh, passenger cars, but also a big chunk of that is light trucks. Uh, and what has happened is you've, what you've seen is very similar movement from what's been going on in the rest of the rest of the world in terms of the, uh, especially the compact SUV uh, segment that has been dominating in, in the US, the, the Europe uh, and in, in Asia over the last probably four or five years. Um, when you look at the top uh, 10 Chinese groups, and here, these are all the, both the independent and the uh, joint venture groups, uh, you can see the, the SAIC group uh, with its joint ventures with uh, VW and GM uh, leading the way, and the other companies uh, 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 trying to catch up in that respect. Um, we looked at the, the, the top in terms of production, and these are the uh, uh, in terms of their independent brands. Notice SAIC is at 608,000 in 2019. Um, this is where the uh, Chinese government expected the, uh, manuf the Chinese manufacturers to learn from their uh, joint venture partners and then start to create their own brands. And so this is where the, the own brand companies come in. Uh, but as you can see, when it comes to their own brands, it's the uh, independent companies that tend that are doing pretty well. But Shang'an, in second place uh, to Geely, uh, uh, is also is a joint venture brand. So uh, there's a it's a it's a mixed uh, it's a mixed bag in terms of what in terms of which companies are are actually promoting their own brands. When we look at what's happened since 2015 uh, from uh, the uh, joint venture productions. And now these are companies doing their own brands, not including their joint ventures. Uh, you see some uh, significant drops from 2018 to 2019 from, for BAIC and, and, and GAC, uh, and some significant growth from uh, SAIC uh, in, in, uh, in this group. And, but it, it's Shang An that it has been the, the leader in this group from, uh, again, there's uh, a joint venture company that has, it's selling its own brands. Uh, when you look at the uh, foreign uh, brand joint venture production, uh, it's uh, VW and, uh, and GM as the leaders. 
Uh, GM took a, a bit of a hit last uh, from eight, 2018 to 2019. It'll be interesting to see what comes out of, out of, out of 2020. Uh, we're expecting lower sales in general in 2020 in China, but maybe not as, not as, uh, as I said, not as deep as we once thought. Uh, we saw some increases uh, from Toyota uh, and, and some particular, uh, some decreases from Ford. Uh, when you look at what's been going on over the last uh, uh, four or five years, uh, we see that, uh, the, of course, the, as I said, the decrease from uh, GM from uh, 2018 to 2019, some significant increases from the, from the, uh, uh, the Japanese uh, entries of uh, Honda, Toyota, and Nissan, um, some growth from uh, Mercedes and BMW, and as I said, some, uh, uh, some decreases from Ford. Uh, so when you look at the independent Chinese manufacturers and their vehicle production, we looked at these, we looked at these before uh, with Geely leading the way. And you look at what's been happening to them over a period of time, they pretty much held up pretty good. There's some, there's some fluctuations. Uh, uh, in some of the manufacturers, there decreases a little bit over time, but most of them have pretty been been, st uh, been pretty steady uh, since 2015. But but some significant growth in from uh, 2017 through 2019 from from GV. And when you look at the number of models, and here you're looking uh, at 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 the uh, uh, the independent companies. If you look at the first number that you see on, on above every bar, it tells you the number of models for uh, in the dark colors, it's the passenger cars, it's, uh, sedans and hatchbacks, and the light uh, gray uh, bars are the uh, SUVs, MPVs, microvans, and the pickups. And you can see where the growth is in terms of the number of models that companies are putting out. Uh, significant uh, numbers of, of SUVs that have been uh, put out by the uh, by the independent companies uh, over their over the passenger car companies over the passenger car models. When you look at the joint venture brands, again, they're also focusing on, on the uh, the SUV models, especially when you look at SAIC. Uh, so they're really seeing this as the as a, a real opportunity uh, in terms of what uh, consumers are demanding, and also from the uh, independent companies. Just for 2019, you can see the the, the growth in in, in SUVs and, and pickups from no, SUVs and MPVs. Probably not as many pickups in in China as we have in the U.S. Uh, and from the domestic brands, uh, same thing. Just from the the 2019. Uh, uh, number of models, uh, having the focus being on, on SUVs. So let's look at some market insights. Here you look at what's been happening from uh, over, this is a, a chart that looks at uh, 2019, 2019 through 2020, January 2020 and February 2020, where you see the, the big hit from the, uh, uh, from in, in sales from the retail growth rate from uh, January to February, but you also see the sales leads, and this is these are people who are considering uh, buying vehicles. That there are still people who are considering buying vehicles, even though the 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 growth rate and the sales uh, monthly sales were down. When they looked at uh, customer preferences, uh, one of the big issues was re reducing the chance of contracting COVID. That became one of the main reasons for buying cars during the during the during the pandemic. This is something that that came uniquely out of China. That did that the the, the vehicles being seen as kind of a cocoon uh, of what uh, and protection from uh, from the virus. Uh, and also, there is an interesting point of, of, of families demanding to go out because they have been been uh, uh, quarantined or or things have been uh, held up, so they were unable to get out. Uh, when when you look at the types of vehicles and and what you know, what what consumers really want from their vehicles, it's still product of, uh, is excellent enough to meet customers' needs as one of the main things, as well as service that is considerate of customers are two of the, two of the main areas of, that they're still looking at when they're, when they're uh, considering buying vehicles. And when you look at what's happened uh, in, during the, uh, in January to February uh, of this year, 
um, something that we've seen in, in many other situations, in particular when we're looking at uh, uh, recessions, uh, it's usually luxury brands that actually survive better than the, uh, than the other types of, of vehicles. So we're not surprised to see that luxuries actually went up a little bit from, from January to February compared to the, to the mass market brands. And finally, when we look at the uh, what are what are the some major software functions that facilitated customers' purchasing behavior, the build one of the big issues was having a built-in air purifier. Uh, this, in particular, was one of the things for both for all customers and, and also customers who were just considering uh, uh, whose ca car buying plan was plan was reinforced by the pandemic. And how much are they willing to pay? Well, they're paying to pay about $430 for something like this. So a, a, every, every uh, challenge in the industry has uh, usually has something that's going to, some companies are gonna come up with ways of trying to uh, maximize their profits. And in, in China, during the pandemic uh, timeframe, it, you're really looking at the, the air purifiers. Um, and when we look at the, the uh, major services that facilitated customers' purchasing behavior, it's the transparent and favorable financial services, uh, but also uh, for people who are just who's, uh, was there, whose car buying plan was reinforced by the pandemic, the issue of uh, having door-to-door -door test driving, contracting, and delivering services. Uh, this is something that uh, we're also seeing in, in the U.S. today. So that's what I've been, uh, what I wanted to talk about uh, today uh, from the first part of my presentation. I'll come back a little after the break to talk about some of the work that we've be do been doing on NEVs. Uh, as, as is always the case, a link to the presentations will be, a be emailed to you this weekend. Okay, so let's go to our... Uh, our next speaker. First, I should stop sharing. There we go. And we'll go to our first speaker uh, of the day, uh, Sanjun Lee. Uh, Sanjun is, uh, let's see, let's get some, let's get you going here and start your video and, and ask you to unmute. And welcome, Sanjun. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Sanjun is a professor of applied economics and policy, and he holds the Kenneth L. Robertson Chair at the Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management at Cornell University. He also serves as the co-director of the Cornell Institute for China Economic Research and the director of graduate studies at the Dyson School. He received his PhD in economics from Duke University, his master's degree from uh, Michigan State University, and his BA from Nankai University in China. His major research areas include environmental and energy economics, urban and transportation economics, empirical, empirical industrial organization, and the Chinese economy. Uh, welcome, Sanjun. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, um, Bruce, for for the opportunity to be here. I'm uh, really uh, excited to report some, some of the studies that, that we do uh, at Cornell. Um, I'm uh, Shanjun Li, um, and today I would like to use the first about 20 minutes to, uh, to introduce one study, then the rest of the time to introduce the second study, both of which uh, are about the Chinese electric vehicle market. Bruce gave a really nice introduction about the broad automotive industry in China, we are gonna zoom in uh, into the uh, electric uh, vehicle segment uh, in China. In particular, we are interested in understanding the role of the garment in this particular market. market. So we know the future of transportation is electric. After about 10 years of market development, the global sales of electric vehicles reached over uh, 2 million units uh, in 2019. So this figure shows the sales from 2012 to 2019 in European countries in red, US in green, and China in blue. So during the past couple of years, the, uh, the sales in China, the EV sales in China uh, have accounted about uh, for about 50% 
of the global EV sales. In terms of the uh, EV market share country by country, Norway has the, uh, by far the largest market share, about 56% uh, in the new vehicle market in Norway. Net Netherlands, 15%, China, 5%, uh, US, about 2%. If you look at the expansion or the charging infrastructure across countries, China by end of 2019 had a, over a, a half a million charging ports. Um, so this by far the, the largest uh, number of charging uh, stations in the world. Now in terms of the market structure, Bruce spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about the broad market structure of, the, uh, of China automotive industry. So let's look at the, uh, the EV production. Um, so China's uh, market is much competitive. Uh, it's less concentrated compared to the U.S. market. So in, in, in the U.S., we have about a dozen uh, automakers that produce EVs. And uh, Tesla is, is the largest, accounts for uh, over 50% of the market share uh, in the EV segment. But if you look at China, there are over 60 automakers that are producing EVs and over 200 models compared to about 70 models in, in the US. BYD has about 20% of market share followed closely by Beijing and Shanghai uh, um, auto. Okay, um, so Chinese government have uh, set, uh, has set very ambitious goals in terms of the uh, electric vehicle um, uh, adoption, but also few economy standard for the industry. Um, so for 2020, the goal of EV sales is 2 million units. Um, and I'm gonna show you what's happening this year. And this is unlikely uh, to be met um, for, for a variety of reasons. 2012, the goal is, uh, is to hit 7 million sales of EVs accounting for about 20% of the overall new, mark, uh, new vehicle market. And 2030, uh, 15 million units of EV is 40% of new vehicle sales. If you look at average fuel economy, the goal is five liters, uh, average fuel economy is five liter per hundred kilometer this year. That's translated to about 47 miles per gallon and comes down to 3.2 uh, liter per um, hundred kilometer that translates to about 74 miles per gallon. So it's quite aggressive. And part of the strategy is to promote uh, the electric vehicles to, in order to meet this aggre aggressive target. Now, in terms of EV sales month by month, during the last few years from 2008, this uh, green bar here shows the month to month sales. In 2018, you can see there's a nice trajectory of uh, increase of the sales uh, month to month in 2018, uh, sorry. The uh, light blue bar in the middle shows the sales in 2019. In the first six months, the sales were pretty nice and there was increased relative uh, relative 2018, but, but we see a dramatic drop uh, from July due to the phase out uh, of the subsidies. But then in 2020, uh, now in February, uh, we, Bruce shows the general kind of sales for all uh, new vehicles but here we see a big drop for electric vehicles as well because much of the country was uh, locked down in, in, uh, in February. But as the country opens in March and April, uh, we see the, the sales um, have increased over time, but uh, we won't, uh, it's very unlikely that uh, China will, will meet the 2 million uh, goal this year. Okay, in order to uh, really pr uh, to um, promote this technology, uh, countries throughout the world have uh, adopted various policies, financial incentives, and also non-financial incentives. Uh, in terms of financial incentives, there are federal um, uh, government incentives and also incentives or, or subsidies from local governments. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the federal subsidy in China and the United States, there are key differences. First, the subsidy, the level of subsidy in China is based on the range, the driving range of the vehicle. Uh, in, uh, in the US is based on capacity. Second, the overall subsidy <coughs> level is, uh, is quite, is actually more generous in China uh, than in, in the US. 
So let's look at the central subsidies or federal subsidies provided in China in RMB in 2013-2019. So it is uh, based on driving range, as I mentioned. In 2013, the minimum requirement for driving range is 80 kilometers. And for those vehicles, they get about $5,000 subsidy. But for vehicles that had uh, range over 250 kilometers, they get over $8,000 worth of uh, uh, subsidy from the central government alone. For PTEVs, the minimum requirement is 50 kilometers, uh, but all the PTEV models actually need this subsidy. So all those models get about 5,000 US dollar uh, subsidy in 2013. Over time, uh, the subsidy has reduced. Uh, for example, in 2015, uh, the subsidy has reduced across the board. Now, at the same time, the requirement has also has tightened. For example, the minimum requirement for driving range has increased from 80 uh, in earlier years to 100 in 2016, 2017, and then increased further to 2,250 uh, uh, in 2018 and to 250 uh, in 2019. At the same time, the amount of subsidy has, uh, has reduced uh, over time. Now there are a variety of local policies, including financial incentive to, in order to reduce vehicle ownership operating cost. Uh, the local incentive uh, tend to be in proportion uh, to the central subsidy. Uh, there are also vehicle tax exemption, charging fee subsidy, et cetera. In terms of fi non-financial incentive, there are several of them uh, that are quite uh, interesting. The first one is a preferential treatment on EVs uh, under purchase quota systems. So what are purchase quota systems? So in China, as we know, um, traffic congestion, air pollution are really very pressing challenges in urban areas in China. So in order to reduce, so to address these challenges, uh, local governments try to really curb the dramatic growth of vehicle ownership. So some of the cities adopt a, a cap or a quota system for newly issued uh, vehicle licenses each year and, and cap that to a certain level. For example, in Beijing, they cap a total number of new vehicles sold or new license issues to about 150,000 units. And then they treat EVs and gasoline vehicles differently under the quota system. The second policy is a road access privilege in may, many cities, again, in order to address uh, traffic congestion, air pollution, some of the cities uh, use this driving restriction policy, which basically says that for a given vehicle, you can only drive four days out of five uh, during the work, uh, work days. And EVs uh, uh, in general are exempt from this restriction. The third policy that is quite interesting to look at is a green plate policy. This policy rolled out in 2016 in three waves across the country. This policy basically says that is mostly really uh, is a marketing effort uh, where the government says, if you buy an EV, you get a distinctive looking green plate um, that for a variety of reasons, for example, to increase the awareness of consumers or to make consumers uh, feel good about themselves as well. Um, so starting from 2018, there are uh, several important changes. Uh, for example, starting from 2018, the subsidy used to, um, you know, based on driving range now is adjusted also based on two additional requirements on uh, energy efficiency, uh, but also battery uh, uh, energy density as well. Starting from 2019, uh, the local subsidies are uh, removed, um, were required to, to be removed by June 26th uh, by the central government. Then there is also this new, new, um, this new energy vehicle credit uh, mandate uh, that are being implemented. Uh, this, under this mandate, uh, each, for each EV uh, sold, uh, the automaker will get a credit uh, as a function of range and energy efficiency, you could get a one credit or 1.2 or 0.8, depending on the range or energy efficiency. And then the total credits from, uh, from an automaker need to reach, uh, for example, 10% of total sales in 2018, and that the uh, percentage is increasing over time. 
The subsidies are scheduled to phase out in 2020, but due to the pandemic, the government ha uh, has extended uh, the subsidies to 2022. Okay, so in the first study, what we are trying to do is try to understand uh, qualit uh, qu quantitatively the, dry, the, the importance of driving factors behind the rapid growth of the Chinese EV market. Um, and we are gonna use, uh, try to really uh, put a number on the impacts of different policies on sales of electric vehicles. What we are gonna do, we are gonna use uh, sales by city, by a model, by a quarter from 2015, 2018 uh, uh, in 150 cities in China. These 150 cities include top 40 cities with the largest EV sales and also their neighboring cities. So these 150 cities accounted for 78% 78 of national EV sales during this, uh, this period that we study. And we also collect comprehensive local, non-local uh, financial and non-financial policies uh, across these cities. Okay. So just to give you a sense of the sales per million resident by city. So in 2015, the average is 67 uh, units per million residents uh, across uh, these 150 cities. But you see there is quite a bit of variation in 2015, but you, you can see in 2018, the variation is, is even larger here. The average is uh, 500 units uh, EVs sold per million residents uh, across these 150 cities. So the idea is really to link the sales the variation in sales across cities over time to changes in subsidies, to changes in other policies as well, in order to understand the roles of, of these different policies, whether financial or non-financial uh, incentives. So this is the only equation that I have in, in the slides. I understand uh, that uh, many in the audience are, are from data analytics. So I wanna show you a little bit was, uh, was uh, under the hood here uh, um, for our study. So the log, the, the, uh, the variable on the left-hand side is log logarithm of sales Q by model, by CDC, and also by time, which is year quarter in our data. We are gonna in, uh, interested in uh, finding out the impact of subsidy, which is part of the consumer price, P for model K, CDC at time T. <clears throat> The subsidy varies across city, therefore the consumer price will be different from city to city, even for the same model in the same quarter. And here is the number of charging ports in our data uh, in the city C at time T. DR is the driving restriction, which varies by model because uh, driving restrictions sometimes are different for different, whether it's an EV or, uh, or P, uh, battery electric vehicle or PTV. Uh, and that varies across city over time as well. And then this GP is a green plate policy that roll out across cities over time. So we, we see this, uh, we see variation across var vehicle models, but also across city um, over time. We are gonna interest in this four coefficient beta one to beta four. The key challenges, uh, the key challenge in really estimating or distinguishing the impact of these policies from other things that, that, uh, that could affect vehicle sales, right? So these could be changes in vehicle attributes such as the vehicle size or, or driving range. But more importantly, there are many other things that could affect vehicle sales or EV sales, but those things could actually also be correlated with the government decision in providing subsidy, amount of su subsidy they provide or the installation of charging uh, infrastructure or the implementation of driving restriction policy or green po plate policy or other policies. So we really want to control for these uh, so-called unobservables, things that we do not observe in our data, but that could affect sales. And those things could also be correlated with the variables that we are interested in. Therefore, if we do not pay attention and if we just do a simple correlation, we could misattribute the impact from other things to the, uh, the impact uh, of policies. We don't want to do that. So we have a, a really econometric model to really control for the other 
we call that confounding factors so that we can have confidence in the estimates of the key coefficients we are interested in. So without going into the details, how we control for those things, I'm just gonna uh, really discuss a bit about the coefficient estimates. Again, the dependent variable, the variable on the left hand of the equation is log EV sales. So this coefficient on consumer price tell us that for an increase of 10,000 uh, RMB in, uh, in consumer price, for example, due to subsidy, we will see about 16% of increase in, um, in EV sales. In terms of the charging ports for increase of 1,000 charging ports in the city, we would see about 20% of the increase in EV sales in that city. And the third variable that we are interested in this EV exempt from driving restriction, we do not find a statistically significant impact, uh, for, uh, likely due to the fact that consumers have other ways to, uh, to uh, bypass this policy. Uh, for example, uh, carpool or, uh, or using DD or using public transit, uh, et cetera, rather than buying an EV uh, uh, to, um, uh, uh, in the presence of this, this policy. The fourth variable that we are interested in this green plate, uh, green plate policy, we find a pretty big impact from this policy. Um, and these results, these, these three coefficients that I show that have statistically significant results are actually quite robust across a whole range of specifications, different controls in the estimations that, that I, I won't have time to go into, uh, go into but um, I'll, I'll provide a paper and that you can, you can look at. So we are quite comfortable with these estimates. Once we have these estimates, we can simulate what would have happened to EV sales if we have removed a policy, one policy at a time. Now, if we remove subsidy policies, the blue line here shows the, the sales under this counterfactual scenarios, together with the 95% confidence interval of the estimates. Basically, our simulation showed that these uh, subsidies from both the central government and the local government accounted for about 55% of the EV sold during this data period from 2015 to 2018. Now, if we remove the green plate policy, we would uh, see a reduction of EV sales by 18%. That's a large reduction if you're thinking about really the relatively low cost of this, of this particular policy. Now, the, the findings uh, uh, shows that the government policies really played a crucial role in the rapid growth of the EV market. Uh, we show the consumer subsidies, about 40, 45,000 RMB, explained about 55% of EV uh, sales during uh, the period from 2015 to 2018. Uh, now that, that has important implications going forward as China is phasing out the subsidies and using other policies such as the uh, new vehicle, um, new energy vehicle mandate and other policies to uh, to, uh, to promote the technology because that has different implications on how automakers are gonna uh, comply with those uh, mandates. Second, we find the investing uh, charging infrastructure actually is very important. Based on our estimates and based on the cost of charging infrastructure, we find our analysis showed that investing in charging infrastructure, for example, through government subsidy is nearly four times as effective as consumer subsidies uh, in promoting EV sales. There are a variety of reasons. For example, you know, uh, uh, it could be due to the fact that um, the private charging is quite limited due to the um, housing structure in, in China. Most people live in condos rather than single family house in the US. And, and also due to the fact that consumers who purchase EVs in the early stage of this new technology are relatively less price sensitive. And this finding, the fact uh, that a charging infrastructure actually is a much better policy in terms of bang for the buck in promoting the EV technology is actually not unique to China. We found the same finding, similar finding in the US, although not uh, this four times, we find about two times as effective. And there are similar results from Norway as well by, by other researchers. 
We also find that this green plate policy, as I mentioned, is very effective. This really highlights important psychological and social dimensions of the diffusion of this particular technology that goes beyond simple in terms of the financial uh, incentive. Okay, so in the remaining kind of a four minutes, uh, I'm gonna uh, briefly talk about the second study where we are gonna try to dig deeper in terms of the subsidy, um, the role of the subsidy. So this shows the worldwide EV subsidy in dark blue here on the top and also worldwide consumer spending on EVs. It basically says that for every $4 consumer put or spend in the EV market, the government put in uh, uh, one additional dollar as, uh, as government incentives, through government incentives. Now, how government subsidized EVs actually uh, varies across different countries. Uh, as I mentioned, China use, uh, based the subsidy amount on the driving range. Japan does the same thing. We call that attributes-based subsidies. The US uh, subsidies based on battery capacity, as I mentioned, South Korea subsidy based on size, battery capacity in the past, but now they are also adding driving range to, um, to that as well. Many uh, European countries use a constant subsidy. So we ask in this study, does the choice of target attributes, whether it's driving range or, capacity or battery capacity or a uniform matter, right? Uh, meaning, does that actually give us different impacts on consumer demand for automakers in terms of profitability on the society in terms of, the, for example, air pollution, holding the total subsidy fixed. So we have a quite a sophisticated model where, where we study this question, but just show you the data, this kind of the pattern jumping out from the data without any model, right? You can look at the driving range distribution in China over time in 2015, you can see there are there is clear bunching on these uh, cutoffs, this 80 kilometer here is the minimum requirement. 150 kilometer, you get more. For 250 kilometer, you get even more. In 2016, they removed the 80 kilometer. They increased the minimum 250. You can see a drop in the number of models in that range. Interestingly, if you look at 2018, there were additional cutoffs, 300 or 400 added to the uh, uh, subsidy policy. And you can see uh, you know, increase in the number of models uh, in, in those ring, uh, driving range. So you can see a clear bunching that suggests automaker actually responded to this policy by changing their vehicle attributes. In, uh, for example, using a larger battery, but, more, but also change their vehicle design, such as reducing the size of the or the weight of the vehicle in order to increase the range. So that's really a, a kind of, uh, from the day you can also see that the difference in vehicle size in China and the US, these are the top 10 EV models. Green represent BEVs and purple represent PTEVs. For PTEVs, because all the PTEV models in China are, are um, meet the minimum requirement of 50 kilometer. So there is really not a binding constraint. So we can see the PTEV models in China have similar size to the PTEV models in the US, the top 10 models, um, top 10 sales. But then if you look at the BEVs, the in green, the BEVs in China are tend to be much smaller than the BEVs in the US because the automakers try to downsize their vehicle in order to increase their range to get more subsidy. So um, I'm, uh, half minutes over time, so I have two more slides. Now, if we uh, base our model, we can simulate what would have happened if we use a different target attributes. For example, if we, instead of using this cutoffs, if we uh, sorry, um, make the subsidy as a linear function of a driving range, instead of the kind of discrete jumps, or if we base the subsidy as a linear function of battery capacity or based on weight or a constant subsidy, what would happen? So the purple bars shows what in our data, the clear bunching as I showed you, the blue bars are the model predictions from our simulations. You can see it, no matter what policy we use, we won't see uh, as dramatic bunching as 
the, uh, as what we see in the data, because automakers are gonna have different incentives in designing their vehicles. For, in particular, if you look at a vehicle weights, when we use a subsidy that is based on weight, we will see automakers who are gonna produce heavier EVs. If the subsidy is based on battery capacity, we'll see firms gonna use a larger batteries. But overall, we find the subsidy design that is based on capacity tend to be the best for, from the society overall. Once we take into account the impact on consumers, on firm profit, on uh, air pollution as well. Again, I won't have time to go into uh, the details, but to conclude, uh, we found that government policy played a really big role in pushing China to be the largest EV market. Um, the policy combined accounted for 70% of sales from subsidies and from the green plate policy. Similar impacts are found for US and Norway. Subsidy based on the driving range as, as, as implemented in China led to unintended consequences in the sense that firms uh, try to downsize their vehicles in order to receive more subsidy that have, uh, 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 that could lead to some socially undesirable consequences. Moving forward, as I mentioned, with the phase out of the subsidy after 2022, could China's market sustain its growth without large subsidies? Based on our analysis, it suggests this is unlikely going to happen unless China is going to wrap up, ramp up other policies in order to push this technology forward. Another question that we have in mind is with nearly uh, you know, 100 EV producers and growing, will there be consolidation as government move from this carrot approach by providing subsidy to a stick approach by using this mandate uh, through LG, um, credit, new, vehicle, uh, new energy vehicle credit or average fuel economy standard. All right, so that concludes my, my talk and, and thanks very much again for the, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, Sanjun. Uh, let's do a little Q&A with you. We got some very good questions from our audience about, uh, about your presentation. All right. Some of it fits in with uh, some of the questions that I already had for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll just start with one of mine. Uh, is the NEV mandate for manufacturers still in place? I believe so. I, yeah, things are changing very quickly. 12% uh, yeah. situation, is that still in place? I, I believe so. Okay. But as situation, you know, evolves quite quickly in China, uh, I need to double check whether there are recent changes. As I mentioned, the, the credit uh, has been extended, or the subsidy has, be, uh, has been ex extended. Uh, that's a new policy, uh, uh, you know, from April. So mm -hmm. things are changing as the government tried to figure out the ways to address, you know, the, uh, the new challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time, they also want to keep this market going and reach the target they set. Uh, in terms of both the, uh, the sales, but also the average fuel economy. Okay. Uh, one of the other uh, uh, questions that came up was, uh, is there more or, or less reliance on public charging infrastructure in China compared to the US? That's a really good question. I think the data on charging behavior is still a bit limited uh, for us to, to see uh, definitely. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are relatively uh, limited private charging stations because people live in condos mo for the most part. Mm -hmm. So they don't really have the space for a private charging uh, port of their own, but rather a lot of condos actually, for new condos, especially there is a government requirement that you actually uh, designate a certain area for charging, uh, charging station for your, for your apartment complex. Um, so, I think my suspicion is, is yes, but I don't have data. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, yeah. In particular, your, your uh, understanding of the, uh, how people live in China, it, uh, if they're, you're living in apartments or in condos, uh, unless you have that already built into the condo, which most of the places do not, uh, you're gonna rely yeah. more on public charging. In the US, more people have, yeah. have, have how homes and garages and they're able to, to do this. So I think that's, uh, that's right. I think it makes more sense that it's a little different different strategy for-, uh, that's right. for yeah. and, and I think they showed up in your data. 
that, so and that's why, yeah. Down. So the yeah. charging was four times more, more important yeah. in, in yeah. China. And you said about two times as important. Two times in the US. In yeah, the US. exactly. Yeah. And it's about also two to three times in Norway as well. And the data we use, the number of charging station in our data actually is our public charging ports. Um, so that tell us the effect of the public charging infrastructure. Okay, very good. Yeah. Um, let's see. Here's another question. This has to do with the, and I think you mentioned this, it has to do with uh, kind of where we are in terms of the evolution of EVs uh, in, in globally, but also in China. And how do you see changes applying, you know, you, you, you put, you showed some good data about how manufacturers would respond with, right. uh, given certain scenarios. How do you right. see that playing out uh, uh, in the probably short term, probably over the next five years or so? Right. Um, so good question. Um, so our study clearly shows that automakers respond to the incentive structure, right? And with the subsidy being phased out, that means the consumer have to pay a higher price for these models. So we suspect that automakers are gonna to try to produce kind of cheaper vehicles and smaller vehicles potentially. And we can see that already in the data, I think for the September, October, I think the most popular EV model in China is not a BYD, is not Tesla, rather it's a, it's a small EV model. I, I, Bruce is nodding, know that, right? Yeah. Uh, it's um, produced by Wuling, uh, and it's only 40, sorry, $4,200. Right. It's a very cheap kind of uh, small, tiny EV model. So I think going forward, I think that's probably gonna be there. But yeah. at the same time, there's a countervailing forces. That is as consumer, as income goes up, as consumers kind of uh, demand for luxury vehicles go uh, increase as well, you would also see kind of automakers gonna want to produce some kind of a luxury uh, or, or high quality EV models as well. So I think the market segmentation will become uh, even uh, uh, even further there. Yeah, that uh, in terms that of the, will expand, yeah. right, right? That's right, that's you right. You see that with NEO and Xpeng and, and it, these are, are more luxury vehicles. Exactly, to tailor to really different market segments uh, as the really as the EV market uh, expand in China as well, as more and more consumers are coming into this market and want to buy an EV model. Right, right. So and we see that from manufacturers uh, just as a way of of managing their costs, because uh, uh, usually for luxury vehicles they're able to charge a little more because uh, right. people are willing to pay a little more. So uh, they're right. the vehicles that uh, uh, that come from uh, on the luxury side. Uh, they can, they, as we've seen so many times in the past, where new technologies show up first on the right. luxury brands. And again, EVs become right. one of the, uh, is, or can be one of those luxuries. That's right. Okay, got some more questions for you. Um, uh, let's see. Now, you know, you and I spoke about this before, and I, 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 I want to get your opinion on this. And, and we'll ask uh, also, uh, 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 Michael Wang about this as well because he's dealing with emissions story. Um, right. The how do you see the Chinese government managing the twin goals of reducing congestion and reducing right. emissions? Right. Um, so yeah. No, those are really tough challenges, and I've done a fair amount of work to look at different policies, including the driving restriction policy that has been uh, implemented in, in many cities, the uh, purchase quota in order to really slow down the dramatic rise of vehicle ownership, especially in the mega cities in China. Um, but then there is also another goal that Bruce, you know, we talk about that is to still uh, grow the industry, right? Let the auto, auto industry grow because that's really considered a pillar industry by, you know, by a lot of provinces in their five-year plan. Um, so they still want to see a very robust, uh, you know, auto market. So this is this is really tr tricky challenge. I, you know, it's, it's you know very tough challenge. Um, I, I, you know, I can't pretend to know the solution to this, uh, but I think that really tells us the importance of vehicle technology in order to address, for example, air pollution issue. 
right? So you really want to promote a cleaner technology, the EVs, um, hydrogen um, cell vehicles and, and other technologies down the road in order to address the air pollution issue, but also have a robust automotive manufacturing sector still, right? That's one policy. Second is there, there, are, there, are, other, there are policies that try to address traffic congestion issue. For example, congestion pricing, that's something that, uh, that I've studied quite a bit. Um, and this is something being considered uh, not only in China, but also New York City, Manhattan, mm -hmm. as we know, uh, that's gonna be slated to, to be implemented in next year, next couple of years, where you wanna put a price on the usage of the road capacity. Once you have a price on this resource, so that it's not free to everybody, and that way people are gonna uh, uh, drive less or thinking about the different routes or different time to drive. Um, mm -hmm. That has been shown uh, 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 as an effective strategy to address this traffic congestion issue. For example, in Singapore, that's a very good example of, drive, uh, of road pricing uh, that they, they have implemented that policy starting from 1975. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm happy to go into details, but I, I, I think, you know, if there are other questions, I, I'll. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I think this questions. is the last question. It's, a, yeah. it's an interesting one and kind of a, a big one that we've, uh, we just kind of recently have found out about. And I, I'm not, not sure if, if it's, uh, what role it's playing for, for EVs. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been talked about is that some of the ride sharing companies and, and DD being one of them are, are purchasing a large amount of EVs. Uh, and we've seen this also in the uh, way that the Chinese, Chinese government has required the provincial governments as well as the central government uh, uh, vehicles to make this transition to EVs so that things were, I mean, uh, uh, in, in China, they call them special purpose vehicles, ambulances, garbage trucks, buses, and these are all uh, kind of being forced into the EV ranks. Uh, but there's this other story about these uh, ride-sharing companies that, buy, that are buying uh, a lot of EVs. Are you seeing that in your research? Um, so we haven't uh, paid a lot of attention to that. I think the, um, this, these are, we call that institutional purchases in China. Right. It is a higher share in China than in the US. Mm. Um, I forgot about that. I think it's about 15 to 20% in China. Okay. Um, so this institutional purchases, whether it's a taxi company or, 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 or other companies, right. um, I think the Chinese government consider, you know, you mentioned Bruce, the special, special purpose vehicles such as the buses, they consider this as almost a captured market where they have a bigger influence in terms of the purchase decision. Right. And they want really, uh, you know, uh, promote those, uh, you know, EV sales in those segments. But at the same time, you know, the, the uh, institutional purchase such as taxi fleet, they could also exert a, a larger influence compared to consumer decisions. Right. And they want to uh, definitely want to take advantage of that as well. I think Hong Tu probably can tell uh, us a bit more how you know uh, how this policy uh, is is affecting kind of taxi fleet and, and you know. Yes, uh, I, I, yeah, I hope he can. Uh, he yeah. Can add, <laughs> add a little to that. Uh, right, right. That story. Uh, we'll ask him when when his time is up. Uh, yeah. But I, I want to thank you for for your presentation and and uh, being with us today. Now because of your work with a variety of these topics that we're working on, we're, we hope you can continue to stay with us uh, and, uh, and, and, and maybe answer some of the other questions that come up along the way related to some of the research that you, you've been doing because you've really been, been looking at this uh, a variety of topics uh, related to, to uh, 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 EVs as well as uh, in particular, I think uh, EVs uh, in, in China. Uh, so again, absolutely, thank you Bruce. Much. Yeah, no, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. All right, let's go to uh, uh, Michael Wang. Uh, Michael, let's uh, unmute you and uh, get your video going. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Do you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see you. Okay, I'll put the oh, video on, and they are share. Show my screen. Let me let me do my little introduction for you, Michael. Okay. 
So Michael is a distinguished fellow and director of the Systems Assessment Center uh, Energy Systems Division at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, he leads the uh, ongoing development of Argonne's GREET model, software model for life cycle analysis of vehicle technologies and transportation fuels. He's a fellow of Society of Automotive Engineers and a member of the Transportation Energy Committee of the Transportation Research Board. Uh, he has a PhD and in, uh, in MS in, in Environmental Science from UC Davis and a BS in Agricultural Meteorology from the China Agricultural University in Beijing. Uh, welcome, Michael. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, do you see one screen or two screen on your ad? I have one screen. I see, I okay. see one screen. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So as you can see, I'm going to present our world rules analysis of plug-in electric vehicles in China with the China grid model. So as you see, I have uh, two people in our group work on this, uh, air, uh, work on this area in the last uh, couple of years. So many of you on this call knows the grid model. So Argon has been developed and applied the grid model over the past 25 years with support of US Department of Energy. The model in fact has two major sub models. As you see here, grid one is um, the so-called fuel cycle model or wheel to wheels uh, modeling for fuel production and combustion of the vehicles. On the other hand, grid two address vehicle cycle energy and emission issues. So these two are kind of work together to address life cycle analysis of vehicle and fuel technologies. Today, my talk is uh, primarily on grid one, the wheel to wheels analysis. Uh, this slide summarizes uh, the grid user base. As of now, we have more than 33,000 grid users globally. The key users include uh, the other companies, energy companies, and government agencies. Uh, this slide shows you some of the derivatives uh, from, uh, from grid. Uh, for example, the Arkea grid we developed uh, that is used by us and other organizations for international civil aviation organizations to examine jet fuel pathway uh, carbon intensities. And uh, as many of you know, California Air Resources Board has developed a grid based on the Argon grid is called CA grid. This is used uh, for California's LCFS regulation comprise. And in the past, the EPA used the grid for its own renewable fuel standard regulation development. And the, some other government agencies such as NHTSA has been used grid to evaluate the impact of uh, the fuel economy regulations. So with DOE and uh, Saudi Aramco support, in the last uh, couple of years, we uh, made some effort to develop uh, um, China grid version for WTW analysis of vehicle technologies, technologies and fuels in China. The uh, model is intended to analyze WTW energy use and emissions for vehicle and fuel technology combinations in China. It is uh, built on the modeling capability with uh, the US grid model. As you see here on the chart, we include uh, many fuel options from different feedstocks and uh, we uh, include uh, different vehicle types in uh, grid, in China grid. Uh, this is a screenshot of uh, China grid. So uh, as you see, we built onto the US grid. Uh, so the first uh, choice is uh, whether to simulate US or China. And uh, 
For the original analysis, we separate China into six regions, as you see here on the map in the bottom. And later on, I'll pre present you some regional result from China grid. And in terms of the time, we cover through 2050 to, pre, to you know, take into account the advice of technology development, both for fuel production and vehicle technologies. The vehicle types, so far we covered on road vehicle types, uh, the passenger cars, not duty trucks and heavy duty trucks. And then we have different functional unit. So now I'll take you a little bit deeper on the different modules in grid. Uh, for petroleum module, as we all know, China imports significant amount of uh, petroleum from different fuels. So we, we benefit uh, from a study that I was part of, the, uh, part of it. So this was uh, published in Nature Energy in 2018. So as you see, the carbon intensity of different petroleum supply sources to China is very different. On the other right, uh, the so-called uh, carbon intensity supply curve for different uh, petroleum supplies to China. And uh, the map show you primarily for now, the petroleum supply to China's, you know, Russian, Central Asia, of course, Middle East, and uh, there's some uh, Central and South America supply. So we uh, was able to incorporate the result as you see here into China grid. The nature gas module took uh, somewhat similar approach. As uh, many of us know, China has expanded nature gas use primarily for power generation and for residential use in cities. And uh, of course, the Chinese uh, nature gas supply is still somewhat limited. So here on the left side, you see the three nature gas supply groups, uh, the domestic conventional nature gas, domestic unconventional gas, and the overseas liquefied nature gas as imported nature gas. So the carbon intensity are somewhat different among the three supply groups. Uh, and on the map, you see how much from where for the Chinese nature gas supply as of 2016. And now if we use the Chinese projection of the growth between 2016 and 2030, so now you see on the right side the nature gas supply from different sources and with different carbon intensities. So if you look at the scale, the prediction is uh, the natural gas used in China will more than doubled from 2016 to 2030. And of course, there are going to be significant amount of natural gas import, either through pipeline gas from Central Asia and Russia, or LNG from uh, Australia, uh, Middle East, uh, and even potentially from North America. So you know, again, the supply curve show you the carbon intensity varies significantly from uh, around five grams per megajoule to uh, as high as uh, 60, 60 some uh, grams per megajoule. Uh, so you know, let's give you a high level summary of uh, petroleum and, and nature gas supply. So now I'll you know, present uh, the electricity module in China grid. So for electricity module, we start from uh, upstream uh, energy recovery, the, the generation of electricity, and of course, tra transmission and distribution, and finally, add use. And we have uh, 
we have uh, many uh, electricity generation technologies included included in the electric uh, electric module. For example, of course, we have coal fired power plant, natural gas power plant, hydropower, wind power, solar power, and nuclear power plant. So here is a uh, um, chart summarize uh, the projection from nine into 2050. So you know, here we have a reference case, lower carbon case and higher carbon case. These are the three cases projected by the International Energy Agency. So you see among the three cases, the differences are significant. So you know, if you look at uh, the black bar, that's called fat power share. So from a reference case to lower case to high case, significant difference in terms of uh, the share of coal fat power plant, wind at the sonar, and uh, nuclear to some extent. So this has significant impact on carbon intensity of electricity generation, as you see in the bottom of the slide. So we see right now, the carbon intensity of Chinese electricity is roughly about 700 grams per kilowatt hour. Looking into the future in 2050, the carbon intensity can vary from uh, six, 600 to you know, about uh, you know, 150 gram, grams per kilowatt hour. So it's really depending on what pathways we're going to see, the carbon intensity can have a lot of variation in, uh, in China in the future. So, you know, so let's cut your nationwide trend from now to 2050. So now if we take a look of uh, the regional variations, so, um, so the chart on the left side show you the 2017 generation mix among the six Chinese regions. So not surprisingly to many of us, the northern regions still renounce heavily on coal, but the southern region, such as the south, renounce uh, significantly on the hydropower. And on the right side, you see the carbon intensity of electricity in regions. So in northern regions, the carbon intensity is as high as, uh, 10, uh, as uh, 1,000 grams per kilowatt hour. Of course, this will have significant impact on PEV, WTW, GHG emission performance among the six regions, which I'll show you later on. So you know, in terms of the, uh, the amount of coal power generated at uh, the provincial level, as you see here, this is uh, in each province, how much electricity generated from coal in 2017. So you know, as you already said, from the previous slide, northern regions and the northern provinces renounce heavily on coal. So as you see on this map, uh, they're very much uh, in uh, northern provinces. And uh, as uh, far as the share of coal fired power plant, the uh, Northern regions, you know, some regions go as high as 90% of the power renewed on the coal. So this has tremendous implication for GHG emissions and for air pollutant, uh, air pollutant emissions as well. And as we all know, Northern provinces still have significant severe air pollution issues and the coal-fired power plants are a significant source for air pollutant emissions as well as for greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So, but yeah, so that was based on generation. But now, you know, let me take us one step further. So if we use electricity in our province, not all the electricity used in our province is produced 
in the same province. Uh, you know, just like in the U.S., we have uh, electricity export and import among different regions in the, U U in the U.S. and similar situation in China. So in, in the last uh, 12 months, we start to uh, analyze consumption-based uh, electricity carbon intensity versus uh, generation-based uh, uh, carbon intensity. So from an uh, analytic point of view, or from ad use point of view, consumption-based uh, carbon intensity is uh, more relevant uh, because uh, from a causality point of view, what cause the carbon and emissions the more imported from ad use point of view, especially for PEVs. So if you look at uh, the original differences, of generation versus consumption-based uh, carbon intensity, there are some differences. And Ahana, uh, three provinces and uh, municipal, municipal penalties here, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangdong. So you know, if you see red versus blue, uh, there are significant differences. In the case of Beijing, the Consumption-based uh, carbon intensity is much higher than generation-based uh, carbon intensity. And that's because Beijing imports significant amount of coal, uh, significant amount of electricity from surrounding provinces, which are based on coal for the power plant. So that's why consumption uh, carbon intensity is much higher the generation-based carbon intensity. But there are different trends in Guangdong and uh, Shanghai. Uh, that's where when the two provinces import electricity, they import uh, electricity with significant uh, share of hydropower. So that's why the consumption CI is somewhat lower, the generation CI for those two provinces and uh, cities. So yeah, this chart summarizes uh, the fuel economy or fuel consumption values we built into China grid. This is the base of um, more than 7,000 individual vehicle models fuel consumption values as published by Ministry of Industry and Information Technology. So you see, of course, you know, different weight classes has very different uh, fuel consumption implications. And uh, the, you know, the four technology groups has uh, different uh, implications on fuel consumption. The internal gasoline cars, battery EVs, hybrid electric vehicles, and PHEVs. So here is the table summarized what you saw the 7,000 some model uh, fuel consumption result. So you know, if you see what's on the right, the real world vehicle energy consumption megajoule per kilometer. So the RCEV, hybrid, BEV, and PLTV has, uh, you know, of course, we all know have very different uh, energy consumption implications. And we you know, took uh, some effort to adjust uh, the labeled fuel and uh, electricity consumption to real world consumption by assuming 20% real world increase in gasoline car fuel consumption. So that implies about 17% uh, reduction in fuel economy. And for BEV, we uh, use the 40% increase in electricity consumption. And that implies 29% reduction in fuel economy. So these are somewhat consistent with uh, what we see in the US. So now, with uh, the electricity generation, with uh, the gasoline, uh, with the petroleum and natural gas modules, and uh, the vehicle fuel consumption values, as you saw in the last uh, couple of slides. So here, you 
uh, say the oil to wheels, greenhouse gas emissions, the above charged gasoline vehicles for the 30 province. The below chart shows the PEV, uh, you know, both uh, battery EV and PHEV in the bottom uh, by province. So your, your why the variation for gasoline car is small among the province and uh, HEV. For PEV, the variation is significant, and that's uh, primarily because the uh, electricity, the electricity embedded uh, carbon intensity. So you know, at high level, if we compare BEV versus uh, gasoline car, that's the first map of this chart. As you see in southern and western provinces, and we see a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. The next chart shows uh, PHEV versus uh, gasoline car, you know, similar trend. But then if you see BEV versus HEV, that's the lower left map, then now the pattern is somewhat different. Now we have uh, more provinces that uh, BEVs may have uh, greenhouse gas emission increase versus HEV. And uh, the uh, last map shows PHEV versus HEV comparison. So yeah, it really depends uh, how you get, how you produce electricity for PEV application and uh, that, you know, how efficient uh, the power tray systems. So, so here you see the four power tray systems. So if we you know, take uh, the BEV versus HEV comparison, so now we see you know, in northern and uh, northwestern regions, we see you know, you know, overall the uh, BEVs would have uh, GHG emissions increased versus hybrid electric vehicles at the provincial level. And uh, quickly, so that's uh, the world to wheels result based on the uh, based on China grid. And uh, you know, at some time we develop a model it's called China vehicle fleet model. This model is leverage uh, Argon's long-term research and modeling effort to you know, look at uh, technology penetration in the transportation sector in China. And uh, they based on the fleet uh, turnover at technology penetration, we predict uh, energy consumption and emissions for the Chinese transportation sector. So yeah, I'll quickly show you the, uh, the model and the uh, separate result. So to increase the data availability at the consistent among the various uh, statistics at highway vehicles in China, we uh, classify the uh, model into three categories at nine types. And uh, they, we uh, based on the historic and the potential future application of conventional ad advanced vehicle fuel and technology combinations. So we uh, add up as 49 detailed vehicle technologies at 10 vehicle and uh, energy, 10 fuel and energy types. So the below you, you see the combination of uh, vehicle types and the fuel types. So these are all built into China vehicle fleet model. So quickly give you some sample result from that. So here we uh, interact uh, between China grid and the China vehicle fleet model to generate a world wheels result. So our base case shows that uh, the uh, energy consumption for the Chinese transportation sector will continue to grow. And together with that, greenhouse gas emissions will continue to grow. So this is the base case. And of course, we have some scenario for lower greenhouse gas uh, uh, in transportation. And uh, so let me take you to um, something we published uh, in 
this past summer, um, you know, we put 11 articles in a special issue in the Journal of Mitigation and Adaptation Strategies for Global Change. So this is uh, from uh, the US and uh, Chinese researchers under the SORC CBC. So the papers, most of the papers are uh, open access. So you can go to the journal to see the uh, articles. So here are, we address the trend of the market and the technologies in the US and in China. And we uh, examine some uh, your specific issues like uh, driving patterns and recharge uh, infrastructure. So your, if you're interested in the, your, some of the specific issues in the PEV space for both China and the US, and we have your know, some of the issues covered. Yeah, let me stop here and uh, to address any questions you may have. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Let's let's bring you back to uh, let's bring your screen back. Yeah, let me just stop. Here. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's it's deep there. You've got a lot of you guys have been doing a lot of work over the last twenty five years, um, and I guess that's where I kind of want to start. Um, you've been using the GREEP model for, like, as you said, you've been working on it for 25 years. Uh, and you've obviously increased its use. You've extended the different ways that it's being used. Um, from your experience, what are the biggest challenges for you in terms of the inputs for the GREEP model? Yeah, data definitely is the major challenge. And uh, is uh, the you know, as that's true for any models, if you do not have renewable data, that your your results are not renewable. So you know, for the US grid version, we benefit for from extensive databases from government agencies such as ERA and EPA and uh, industry sources, of course. We uh, interact uh, with the industries, the energy industry and uh, other industry to generate uh, better data in order to uh, produce renewable results. The China grid uh, face same challenge. Uh, data renewability is a major challenge. And uh, between US and China, data availability in China is still a major issue. So data is somewhat limited in China. So we, you know, through our collaboration, through our research, we got as much as we can. We uh, benefit all the available Chinese data sources for China grid. But China grid data is still not as renewable as uh, the U.S. Uh, grid. Are there some some areas uh, in the the data from China that you you see in particular is that you would like more uh, more detailed information on? Yes, uh, we do. Yeah, uh, for your uh, for the Chinese uh, situation, the VR cooperation, as you saw, we got. Uh, seven stars and some model specific data for fuel consumptions. And we uh, made some effort to address our road fuel consumption versus uh, the certified or window sticker fuel consumption values as published by Ministry of uh, Industry and Information uh, Technologies. But still, you know, there are still large variations of uh, on road fuel consumption versus uh, certified fuel consumption. And uh, that's where I think uh, still more effort uh, would be beneficial. And uh, you know, we know for advanced technologies like uh, BVs versus internal combustion engine technologies, our, our road uh, degradation is uh, very different. And uh, we, we know consumers now realize that, uh, we as researchers realize that. So that's still our uh, major area. And another area is 
for gas and diesel. So gas and diesel use of we are benefit from uh, the publication of different crude supply to China. So we feel comfortable with uh, that. But petroleum refinery operation in China, we still do not have uh, enough data and understanding of the gas and diesel production for the Chinese vehicle use. Right. So in, in that case, are, are you estimating uh, doing estimates based on what other countries are doing in terms of the uh, that that particular those particular variables. We are doing uh, both ways. We're doing some uh, modeling for uh, individual Chinese refineries using the, the so-called linear programming models available. Uh, so that would give us some sense of the energy and mass balance of petroleum uh, refinery operation. As we compare the model, the result uh, with uh, the result we see in the U.S. because the U.S. petroleum refineries have some data reported to ERA and EPA, so we do some cross comparison. The problem is uh, cross comparison is, is suffer from from a major issue. Refinery configurations are very different. Even within a country, if we see the refinery in Chicago area versus refinery in California, very different. And uh, the Chinese refinery configurations are very different from uh, US refinery configurations. So that and uh, some uh, technical challenges for cross comparison. Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, one question about the electricity module. Uh, you showed some uh, big differences, significant, huge significant differences mm -hmm. between the low and the high carbon case. Um, what will determine whether the low or the high carbon case plays out in the uh, 2050 timeframe? That's a good question. And the, uh, the high carbon case reflect uh, the economics. Coal is still cheap. So if you are at coal is cheap, coal is the, you know, the base, your power supply. At the one that sooner you know, came a long way, and then has become uh, you know, cheap. To, to be able to compete uh, with coal as a natural gas, but they won't at the sooner still have uh, this uh, intermediate issue as we all see in the US and China and many other countries. So you know, there were still your know, your your, your monitored situation with the significant penetration of the wind at the sooner whether the Chinese grid system will be able to uh, you know, adapt. So that's a big unknown globally for your know, scale up when that sooner. And if we do you know, air pollution control, the air pollution control itself has pushed the retirement of coal fired power plant as we see in the last 10 or 15 years in China and in the US as we have seen as well. So that's our trend will continue. Greenhouse gas emissions is really depend on the individual country's commitment. And in China, China committed to a Paris Agreement. So that's our major drive force for your coal fired power plant retirement. And uh, lately, China commit to carbon neutrality in 2060. If this commitment are to be fulfilled, then you know, we you know, see a very high chance to get to the lower carbon scenario. But if not, we may end up in the higher carbon scenario. And for example, last year, 20, 2019, we see a bump in newly built Coal fired power plants in, in 2019 in China. So you, know, you never know your know, situation will go to the lower carbon pass mm -hmm. for sure. 
Right. Yeah. It sounds like it's a, it's going to be a, a very challenging time. It's true for the U.S. as well, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it, in particular, if you're going to continue to build coal-fired power plants, mm -hmm. you're not going to retire those new ones very soon. Uh -huh. Right, right. It, and there has to be some kind of incentive, some kind uh -huh. of, of, of ways of, of encouraging uh, and supporting the, mm -hmm. the, the transition. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the re you, you, meant, you, you showed some data on renewables. Um, in, in the U.S., we've seen a lot, of, a lot of work on renewables, and it's really mm -hmm. shown some real growth. Uh, what, how are renewables playing out in China? The Chinese renewable growth is faster than the U.S. renewable growth. Uh, what I mean is uh, solar and wind specifically, and uh, and the uh, absolute term and rent peak term, the uh, growth was faster there, and uh, also the Chinese nuclear power will grow. Uh, the U.S. as you know, many of us know, is nuclear is you know, subject to a lot of uncertainties because other issues, the safety issue and other issues. But in China, there is plan to continue to scale up uh, the, uh, the nuclear power generation. Hardly in in U.S. there is no much growth or capacity left uh, for hardly. In China, there is still your know, potential resources harder power growth. Of course, now there are some, uh, there are some concerns about uh, the, your, the your high head hydro versus low head hydro. The Chinese ambitions are the high head hydro growth, the big dams, not uh, said small dams, distributed hydro. The, of course, there are some uh, environment and politic uh, debate about that because uh, the growth will be way in southwest China mm -hmm. and uh, neighboring countries like India and, and Vietnam and uh, Thailand are really concerned about the high, high head uh, hydro with large dams built in China but affect the downstream ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question for you. Uh, You've been working with a lot of your colleagues uh, in, in China. Uh, you have colleagues in China that you've been going and meeting with and, and working with on these issues. Uh, and, and you've provided the results to the, to, to the colleagues and to the Chinese government. How, is, how has the government responded to your findings? Well, uh, you know, the previous uh, presenter talked about uh, the, uh, the uh, battery EV regulations and, so, and other policies. In the last uh, 20 some years, uh, through uh, our engagement or myself personally in, involved with uh, my Chinese collaborations, we have had some uh, um, uh, impact on the Chinese policy development. For example, the fuel consumption status, the, the phase one status put in place in 2003, then just subsequently phase two, uh, two three, and four. You know, we have had, you know, our result was used uh, by the organizations who developed the fuel consumption status. The PEV, your old, your the equivalent ZEV requirement or the NEV requirement in Chinese term, uh, we together with other organizations such as uh, UC Davis, RCCT was involved in the PEV incentive and the PEV sales requirement uh, uh, discussions. So you know, some of our results were used uh, in the NEV sales requirement. On the other hand, what has not been used uh, was what I presented today, WTW results. Wow. So you know, we present WTW results of different technologies, uh, BEVs, uh, PHEVs, and so on. So, so far, the policies was not reflect uh, with uh, the WTW result. So I hope someday 
the WT, W results will be reflected in recognitions in China and in other parts of the world, like EU and US. Japan already take WTW into the 2030 fuel consumption status, but other countries has not. Very good. All right, Michael, I want to thank you for your time today. Um, uh, Sanjun, are you still with us? Yes, I am. I wanted to ask you if there's any uh, things that, that any uh, issues related in the, your research on emissions that you want to, would like to add to the uh, to this discussion about a, a emissions in China. Um, no, I don't really have anything to add other than saying that we actually have been using some of my uh, Michael's earlier research in our analysis, but I'm happy to discover you know new uh, findings and uh, research, especially the consumption-based uh, mm -hmm. greenhouse gas emission results. So I'm actually looking forward to, to read the article. Uh, I, based on the slides, it seems that that article mm -hmm. is under review now. Uh -huh. So it would be great if we, if we can actually get that article and, and actually be able to cite that results, uh, you know, the cross uh, province by province uh -huh. emission um, uh, results for PEV and the PTEV. Uh -huh. um, so that, that's really helpful because that's actually something we are uh, using to uh, to actually quantify the benefits uh, of, uh, of EVs in China. So. All right, very good. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Sanjun. Uh, please uh, please stick around for uh, the rest of the conference to uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you have any things you want to add to the uh, to the discussion. Before we get into our next speaker, I want to share some of our uh, recent research on the. Um, on the China's uh, new energy vehicles. Uh, Sanjun has spoken about some of this already, uh, but I wanted to go over a little bit some of the things that, that we found out uh, and we will, before we go to our next speaker, um, looking at, I'll be looking at the Chinese fleet and the NEVs, uh, batteries, charging, and some policy issues. <clears throat> In terms of the fleets, you know, as of June 2020, the number of motor vehicles in China has reached 360 million, which means there are now more vehicle motor vehicles in the U in China than there are in the U.S. Um, luckily for for China, they don't have as many uh, vehicles per household as we do in the U.S. But um, those are primarily uh, uh, automobiles uh, and increasing and. In, in, uh, about two, 20 million units annually. Uh, but of course, uh, because of some of the issues that we talked about in China, there's a shortage, shortage of about 80 million parking lots in the country. And when you look at the size of the cities, there are 69 cities that have fleets surpassing a million vehicles. Uh, 31 cities have uh, over 2 million vehicles in their fleets. 12 cities have 3 million and Beijing owns the most vehicles with more than 6 million vehicles. Uh, and as of June, uh, according to, to the uh, uh, official agency for NEV administrations, total number of NEVs have reached uh, 4.1 million vehicles in China. Uh, the, this is the monthly sales data from 2013 on NEVs for, uh, until 2020. Uh, it's pretty hard to read, but you can see that at one point around 2018, uh, they, they peaked, uh, you see a continuing growth in, in December. So it's, it will, we'll, we're expecting a, a large uh, number of uh, increase in, in NEVs in, in December. But when you look at what's happened between uh, 2020 and 2019, uh, again, you see the, uh, uh, the increases uh, that have uh, took take, taken place in July and August, September and, and October even, uh, that were not there in 2019. Uh, because of, uh, as, as uh, Sanjun was speaking uh, earlier, that the elimination of subsidies that took place at the end of June in 2019 caused this uh, significant decrease in sales uh, in July and onward until, the, till, till December. And that's something that's changed within the uh, within 2020 because of the reinstitution of the of the subsidies. When you look at the uh, 
uh, NEV quality survey that, that JD Power put out recently, uh, you see one, one particular thing jumps out at you is that, is that there are no foreign companies here other than Tesla. Uh, and uh, it, it shows that the, the, the BEVs have, there's some, some significant differences among the brands, but particularly uh, Tesla and NEO are the ones that stand out as, as being better in terms of uh, initial quality. Uh, in terms of battery, uh, there's a couple things going on in batteries in, 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 in China. And one is this thing called battery as a service. Uh, NEO is already uh, unique in that they do, they do uh, instead of battery charging, they do battery swapping. So they have systems for uh, people coming in and, and swapping out the batteries for their vehicles. But they also have this thing called battery as a service. And it's a way of making EVs more affordable. Uh, users can be, can buy a vehicle, and in, uh, if they put up uh, about ten thousand uh, dollars from the and that, uh, they'll get a, uh, a ten thousand dollar reduction in the purchase price, and pay a monthly fee of about one hundred forty dollars for a battery pack, kind of a rental for the battery. And meanwhile, the users still enjoy the purchase tax exemption and the government NEV subsidies. Uh, Xpeng has does is, has done a similar thing. Uh, they launched their battery leasing program. Uh, again, these tend to be the luxury vehicles, so they are a little more expensive to start with. Uh, but but the, the example that we have here of, of a, uh, a user can pay only about $18,000 to get a, a vehicle excluding the battery and spend about $114 per month uh, for uh, kind of renting the battery pack. Um, Besides, uh, XPeng also grants a 30% down payment ratio for consumers to get the battery-free uh, uh, car body, and thus uh, people need as low as $5,000 be able to drive a car home. Uh, G. Lee is, is, is making a move uh, to, towards battery swapping, similar to what uh, NEO does with their, ba with their uh, batteries. Uh, uh, they have, uh, G. Lee has a uh, completed construction of 35 battery swapping stations in the country. Uh, they'll have that by the end of 2020, and they expect to do a, a, a thousand more. Um, one station has about uh, 30 charging lots inside, and uh, they can do about a thousand swaps per day. Now, when you think about battery swapping, you can't help but think about battery swapping is really similar to going to a gas station where you're going in and very quickly coming in and out with a, with a, new, uh, a, a new battery. One of the issues that, that I have with the, this strategy is that this means that GD has to have pretty much battery swapping uh, uh, stations everywhere, as many as they have gas stations, as we would have gas stations. But these gas stations that we have fill up every vehicle. Whereas the, uh, if the battery companies start ever doing this battery swapping, each company will have to have its own battery swapping uh, construction and stations, which will, will multiply, and especially the cost of land in, 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 uh, in, Beijing, in Beijing and Shanghai and in the major cities, seems like it'd make it pretty challenging for uh, people to do this, and they, because these, these stations are going to have to be near your home because you're going to have to, you may have to just swap out your battery sometime and you don't want to have to drive very far to have to do this. So this is one of the challenges I see with the swapping story. There is a new JV between CATL, one of the, the largest battery companies in the world with uh, FAW. Uh, the JV story, very similar to the JV story with General Motors and, and LG Chem in the U.S., where, where the manufacturers now have more skin in the game in terms of how much they're going to have to put in and also uh, get back from a, a, a joint venture relationship. And so that there, what's, what's interesting about this uh, uh, JV is that they're going to provide, provide vehicles for, I mean, batteries for uh, vehicles for FAW vehicles, but also for uh, Volkswagen's MEB-based models. The uh, the ID3 and ID4 were all based on, will be based on, on this uh, joint venture between uh, FAW and CATL. 
In terms of charging, you're really looking at lots, uh, the continued growth of charging in, in, in China. Uh, the blue bars are cumulative, so you can see this is, these are public charging piles. These are not, not, not uh, uh, individual charging. So there's, there are more uh, uh, com combined charging uh, uh, piles throughout, the, throughout China than there are here. But most of them are more, there are more public charging, I think, than there are private at this, at this stage. Um, uh, the blue bars show the cumulative. The red, the red bars show you the, the number of, uh, of uh, stations that are increasing and the percentage in the, in the orange line of the percentage increases uh, on a month to month basis. Uh, so you can see the continued growth in charging. And this map shows you uh, on a, on a uh, basis of a um, uh, province by province basis where, the, where as of May of this year, uh, where, where most of the charging uh, stations take place. And you can see some of the major uh, uh, provinces, Guangdong, uh, Shanghai at 63,000, uh, uh, Beijing at uh, 57,000. Uh, these are a so, tremendous amount number of, of uh, public charging stations that, that China has put out and continues to put out. Uh, in terms of Tesla and their chargers, they've already constructed more than 20,000 chargers. In China, there are 490 supercharging stations with over 2,000 destination chargers covering more than 250 cities. Uh, as, as they know, they're, because they're going to have to, as we've discussed already, that there's going to have to be more public charging in China than, than maybe in the U.S. Uh, and just in, in Q3, uh, Tesla has built uh, 146 supercharging stations and 137,000 charging piles globally. The charging network will have an internet uh, have internationally is more than 30 percent more than a year just a year ago. And in terms of policy, and I think Sanjun spoke about this already. The two major things that have taken place in in 2020 is the extension of the subsidy plan until the end of 2022. Um, with uh, sudden uh, decreases over time. Um, but commercial NEVs, there won't be decreases in 2020 and the decrease rate uh, will be 10 and 20% compared to that of, uh, of 2019. Um, it only applies to NEVs that are uh, $42,000 or, or more eligible for the subsidy, which is significant. And it kind of eliminates the, the lower end vehicles. And there's a threshold for a number of vehicles that can get a subsidy with the limit set at, at 2 million uh, vehicles annually, which is a, which is a total of, two mil, of, of all vehicles. So uh, not just by manufacturer. And the new plan is effective uh, as of July. Uh, and uh, there's no change in the standards for energy density. And, uh, and, and the last thing for, for the subsidy plan that, that, that modified was the, uh, uh, it, the reduction, uh, the decrease in the, what the government expects of NEV sales to represent in 2025 from 25% to 20%. Um, the administration, they say, is making this change for more stable progress in the NEV market while decreasing the pressure put on the manufacturers uh, and giving them more time to uh, come up with uh, more vehicles and and sales uh, of, of NEVs. And finally, we, got the, we have Beijing's quota system. This is a very interesting story. Um, there's, as of October of this year, there are 460,000 applicants for purchasing, purchasing a vehicle in Beijing, not just NEVs, but any vehicle. And this number has decreased compared to the last reported period since many people have already uh, gotten their license plates. Uh, uh, they were winners of the NEV quotas for families that don't have cars during the pandemic. Uh, so those people got uh, a priority in terms of, of getting plates. And so of the 40, 54,000 uh, for 2020, it, again, just in Beijing, uh, according to the current policy, new applicants need, will need to wait more than nine years for their turn to buy a car. And, and, and when it comes to Beijing license plate, there, there has been a, a black market. 
There used to be a way to buy Beijing plates from other people by faking a marriage with the buyer, then divorcing after the plate is successfully transferred to the buyer. Uh, a, a policy to ban this kind of illegal transaction goes into effect uh, in January of 2021, and and thus the the price has increased for for the on the black market, so that it's going to cost uh, twenty thousand dollars for males uh, and uh, twenty two thousand dollars for females to be able to get a get a uh, 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 to be married to somebody so that they can get a plate. Uh, last year, the price was around $15,000. So this is something that uh, uh, has, has come up re recently. I thought I wanted to, to share that with you. Um, let's look to, let's go to our, our, next, uh, our next speaker, uh, Han Tu Zhu. Uh, he's the, uh, he joined DD in uh, 2018 from his position of endowed uh, Bao Shenjing Professor in Diagnostic Imaging and a tenure professor of biostatistics at, uh, at the MD Anderson Cancer Center and a tenure professor of biostatistics at University of uh, North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, Dr. Zhu chairs the Department of Statistics and Decision Sciences and Feature Engineering with AI scientists and engineers on the development of innovative solutions for DD's ride hailing platform. Dr. Zhu received his PhD degree in statistics from the Chinese University in Hong Kong in 2000. Uh, Dr. Zhu, uh, welcome. Can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, thanks to the organizer for invitation and I also thanks Harry for, for, for introducing me to the workshop. And uh, this is a joint work with my collabor collaborators at the DD and all of my uh, other researchers. And uh, this is a talk about, uh, I want to say today, is about many, uh, the three main sections. The first one, it's about AI for marketplace, and there's many my background. The second one is DDS examples. The third one is about uh, what I have been doing at the DD. And uh, the AI for marketplace. Okay. And uh, everybody knows the AI is artificial intelligence, and uh, there's a lot of success about AI. And, things in the last 10, 10, 10 to 20 years. And uh, in the last three years, Dr. Michael Jordan has been talking about the AI success in four generations, in you know, four uh, categories of um, applications. And then in each generation, it has a set of applications and its associated uh, methods. And uh, the first generation is between 1990 to 2000 and focus on search fraud detections, search engines, and the supply chain management, among others. Companies that use the various uh, statistical methods such as random forest to reduce the fraud detection rate. The second generation is between 2000 and 2010 and focus on re recommendation system and the social media and develop a, a Developing an efficient product recommendation engines is critical for many e-commerce e companies, including uh, Amazon, Alibaba, eBay. The third generation is from 2010 to now and the focus on speech, speech recognition, translation, and the computer vision. People are developing various uh, deep learning based models to mimic the human intelligence, but it's far from human intelligence so far. The fourth generation is an emerging one that focuses on the various markets, including clothing, food, housing, transportation, education, Medicare, and nursing. Markets basically uh, use the Internet of Things and the cloud computing to connect your customers and the products together, producing new commercial platforms such as Uber and Didi. It involves multiple agents making a sequence of decisions 
and uh, leading to improvement of customers' experience and efficiency. And uh, the definition, what is the two-sided markets? Two-sided markets are roughly defined as the markets where one or several platforms enable interaction between end users and try to get to the two sides on board by properly pricing each side, okay? There are uh, several examples of the two-sided markets include Airbnb, eBay, Uber, um, uh, Didi, and Amazon, okay? For example, Airbnb is a two-sided market with the hosts in side one and travelers uh, in side two. And uh, we use Didi um, as an example. And the ride-sharing platform is also two-sided market with the customers inside the one and the drivers inside the two. It is uh, um, a, a complex of the spatial temple ecosystems. The relationship between the two sides, the customer and the drivers is a very complex, it's nonlinear and interactive. Such a relationship is uncertain due to influence of environment and other factors. It's also a, call, a, a complex causal uh, um, relationship as we, as we are detailed below. Right. As a reliable shared travel um, platforms has more than um, 550 plus millions of users and is serving more than 10 billion trips per year. And it has more than 11 um, business units including taxi, express, premier, enterprise, bike and e-bike among the many other um, business units. And actually the, the number of the uh, business units is increasing almost every year. And they just also provide flexible working opportunities and incomes to millions of, of tens of millions of drivers. And in general, the company provide app-based transportation services, including the taxi hailing, prime, private call hailing and the social riding sharing and the bike sharing and also on demand and the delivery services and auto automobile, the services including sales, leasing, leasing financing, maintenance, maintenance, fleet operation, electronic vehicles charge and the co-development of vehicles with auto makers. And actually we just uh, released a new product called the D1 uh, kinds of the uh, DD cars. And also it is one of the uh, leading sort of ride sharing platforms in the world. And it has launched the service in many countries, include, uh, including the Brazil, Mexico, um, Chile, and, and Australia, Japan, and Colombia, and Russia, and many other countries. Now it cover more than uh, 260 major cities. Since the 2015s, DD has invested in Grab, Nift, Ola, Uber, 99, Bolt, and uh, Korean, and they expanded into Latin America, Australia, and Japan. In July the, uh, 2018, the DD acquired 99, a, Bra a Brazil rider heading uh, app. And also it is one of the largest big data companies um, and platforms. And uh, every day DD acquires um, um, the, uh, more than uh, 100, uh, 106 terabytes of the vehicle trajectory data per day and uh, processed uh, around uh, 5,000 terabytes of the data per day. And have DD has uh, around 40 millions of the routing requests per day and also around uh, uh, to calculate uh, around 15 billions of the locations of points per day. And, uh, and, and using Peking as examples, if we use the, the trajectory data connected in one day in Peking, we're able to redraw the city the, uh, trans transportation maps for more than um, kinds of 500 times. Welcome to Didi Chuxing. Didi was founded in 2012 and has been dedicated to providing comprehensive transportation services, including taxi, express, premier, lux, 
bus, designated driving, enterprise solutions, bike sharing, e-bike sharing, car sharing, and food delivery. DD has become the world's leading one-stop mobile transportation platform, serving more than 550 million users in over 430 cities. DD has provided more than 30 million daily trips and 10 billion annual passenger trips. Since our establishment, we have put our mission of to build a better journey into practice. Behind each satisfying journey and smiling user is our company's faith in user value creation, data-driven thinking, win-win collaboration, integrity, growth, and diversity. We strive to ensure that our users travel in safety through technological innovations. We have launched accessible transportation, smoke-free premier, and bilingual services to provide more comfortable experiences for our users. In 2017, DD Chuxing helped reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 1.507 million tons, equivalent to the emissions absorbed by 126 million trees in one year. We are cooperating with tens of cities of intelligent transportation, where we leverage big data and artificial intelligence to make urban transportation more efficient. In 2017, we set up DD Labs in the Silicon Valley. DD provides ride hailing service in Brazil via the App 99, online hailing service in Mexico and Australia under the DD brand, and taxi hailing service in Japan through a joint venture. Going forward, we will continue to place safety as our top priority, making breakthroughs in innovation and development and will harness the power of technology to lead revolution in automotive and transportation industry and create a future of infinite possibility. DD, more than a journey. And, and uh, this is a uh, uh, AI technological laid out at the DD. And uh, actually we have been working in these five and uh, seven uh, different major topics and uh, the, including this intelligence operation, smart vehicles, smart transportation, air for social good, safety, and mapping, and intelligence, intelligent customer services. Um, today's talk is mainly uh, cover the intelligence operation. And uh, in the last three years, I have been working with a group of the smart people to develop a general framework for the two-sided markets. Our final goal is to, to develop from technical side is to develop an alpha zero. And if people are familiar with that, it's a goal kind of game. You all call a simulator in order to evaluate and improve the operational um, efficiency of the ride sharing um, platforms. And actually in the last uh, three years, we have identified the three and uh, five major research topics, including supply demand forecasting. The second one is a supply and demand diagnosis. The, and then the policy assessment and the policy optimization. And the last one is the customer life of the value. And actually they needed the method from the experiment designs, deeper reinforced learning, spatial temporal modeling and the graphical model. If people are familiar with the interest in data science and this is a great topic for people jumping inside. And I uh, just give a basic uh, summary of the, the, all these new developments in the ride sharing business uh, in these five um, major topics. And uh, give us uh, ideas, the first topic is about supply the demanding planning. And the problem interest is to develop for, to predict uh, the demand supply distribution across many cities, okay? And this problem is quite a complex and uh, due to the large number of cities, the heterogeneity is across the cities, the complex spatial temple pattern, uh, patterns across different countries and different area. And also there's some of the kinds of causal relationship among the different environmental factors and all the supply and the demand chain and the distributions. 
And actually, these problems that you think people think about is very similar to weather forecasting, okay? Our goal is to improve uh, the, the service quantities of the ride sharing platform to both the drivers and the riders. For, for, for the driver side, and we want to reduce the hours of empty driving. And for the rider side, we want to, to provide intelligent travel guidance and to reduce the, uh, the cruising times. Okay. And from the, for, from the, for the platform side, if we have the, the, the good, the better supply demand for customers can, can fill in the demand and supply gap and recognize the market and we, have, we can have the better dispatching and the scheduling. And uh, at the very beginning, we, we started with basically to try to develop a forecast and to predict the future orders, okay? And why is it important? Because it's in order us to get prepared for future peak hours and also dispatch vehicles for the regions with high demands. And also we can now us to de detect abnormal road conditions and respond to the emergency. And in general, the demand forecasting empowers better strategies and the services outward, okay, beforehand. And uh, actually we, de we develop a series of all these models so we, with uh, the, the whole system. Forecast system is based on these kinds of deep uh, spatial temporal forecasting uh, system. It's a consists of th three major parts. The first the, is the graph generations and uh, basically incorporate various the different relationships. For the graph generation, we consider three types of the spatial dependency, including road connectivity, PUI similarity, and the spatial uh, labor. And also we consider these kinds of contextual gated temporal uh, modeling and to, to, to try to, to incorporate your temporal relationship across times. And also we build this kind of uh, special uh, multi-gated uh, connect um, uh, CN uh, method. And actually we try to, to incorporate the temple to a special uh, relationship among the different uh, kinds of the uh, amount of this special dependency. Another kind of the method that we developed is basically is the space supplying the demand diagnosis. Um, why do we um, care about uh, this kind of the, uh, the, the problems? And actually we are interested in developing causal models for supply and uh, uh, the demands. We wanted to develop a metric to measure uh, the supply and the demand equilibrium at the both the local and the global levels. The left upper figures shows that the two scenarios, the first one is the demand is much larger than supplies. And the second one is the demand is much smaller than supplies. And actually measuring supply and demand equilibrium at both global and the local level is critical for optimizing where there's um, different to the poly platform policies. Okay. And uh, this is the, at the single time points, and actually you'll see these kinds of the supply and the demand distribution in a particular uh, city um, in China. And actually in practice, you, you keep in mind the drivers can move around and pick up the customers with some moving cost. And finally, we compare the, this distribution of the demands and the, and the, and the distribution of supplies as the transporting, then basically uh, you know, when we try to define this metric, we need to consider both the cost and the transport. Okay. And uh, this is a, a demo we showed in last year, NIPS, and actually this is the uh, demand and supply, the kinds of the uh, distribution has the, this the varied uh, across the uh, times and across the locations. And why do we care about uh, quantify these kinds of uh, the supply and the, and then the deploy, uh, supply and the demand equilibrium? And there is, uh, this is very critical for uh, dynamic supply demand mismatching uh, kinds of the, um, the problems. Specifically at a time the T minus one, and we can compute the supply and the demand at the T, T minus one. 
And actually, based on these kinds of the mapping, and actually we can calculate and whether this is supply and demand mismatch at this time point. And at the same time, we will obtain these kinds of some um, macro metrics uh, uh, such as the completion rate at this time, T minus one. And uh, based on these results, and actually the company need to decide what kind of policy for us needed to take at this moment, and actually, and to, to solve these all kinds of existing uh, dis, uh, uh, the, the supply and the demand mismatching. Okay, in that case, so we basically will start a kinds of new policy at the, at the T. And as, then we, after we apply this kind of new policy, then we can see the new kinds of new demands and new supplies. Then, then we can see carefully the new supply and demand mismatching. And also we can get a new kinds of um, macro the metrics. And actually at the, that's the next time points and we decide whether we need to continue to use this policy or not. And actually, or we can need to change the policy or not. Then we can continue to run this, uh, uh, these kinds of the, our platforms across different cities across time. Okay. And uh, another thing that uh, we have been doing is called uh, optimization dispatching. Actually, one thing, the critical thing is how to optimize the, 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 the companies, the, the policies. And uh, this is uh, actually is optimization problems. It's a dynamic optimization problem. For instance, you have the demand and actually the retrieve request stream in through the days. And all the supplies, the drivers, Drivers of availability in a certain sense is a sort of caustic and also is driven by the demands. Okay. And from the platform side, we have these online dispatch and matching um, policies. And uh, we wanted to optimize the certain um, objects in order to, object, to optimize these kinds of policies. Our objective of interest include like uh, total driver's income, as the drivers care about it. And also, we care about it from the customer side like fulfillment rate and also response rate and also pick up or distance, okay? That's all the, the important factors we need to consider when we try to optimize all these different policies. We have already developed this kind of, this kind of system called the intelligence order dispatching systems and uh, based on the deeper reinforced learning. And uh, I think the reinforced learning have the greatest success in various games and robotics. But there is an industrial application is a, a still at the early age. That because the, the reinforced learning usually requires connecting tons of the important information across the time, the gain of time by reinforced learning must be larger than the cost of connecting such information. Okay. And uh, this is the, our intelligence order dispatching systems. The most important innovation comes from the fact that from traditional uh, kinds of or the approach. Uh, based on this, the CAM algorithms, we optimize, we formulated as a continuous optimization problems on the timeline. Okay. And uh, our kinds of the, the, our MDP formulation for dispatching actually is every, we, we treat every, we assume that every dispatching decision affect the future supply the distribution. We try to maximize driver the connective income through the optimizing dispatching when encourage a good customer experience. And uh, the reason we use the reinforced learning because we focus on long-term reward and uh, over days and over um, a longer time for the, for the customer side. And then we can see the future impact of the customer decisions. And also uh, the most important factors that we use the value function is the key quantities to learn. And uh, this is uh, one of the, so our um, work in 2019, so VNet for dispatching. It appears on the deep, deep uh, Q learning and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and the learning plus the planning online the dispatching framework. It's intendable to incorporate uh, con contextual features like the weather, dates, real-time supply and the demands. And the knowledge is easily transferred to multiple tasks and uh, uh, the joint tasks. And then we have deployed this kinds of deep reinforced learning based kinds of the uh, strategies in various um, in, in our platforms. 
And actually, some of the key kinds of the uh, policies are actually in the top 20 cities in China. We can increase the, uh, the our kinds of global micro metrics for one to five percent. Okay. And uh, actually, we we received um, um, our recent paper on ride sharing handling the order dispatching on DD wide reinforced learning received the 2019 uh, Daniel's Wagon Prize Award for excellence in the practice of the advanced analytics and operation research. And also, we also posted our presentation videos at the YouTube. If you are interested, you can take a look at it. And actually, in, the, in this year, we also developed a, a kind of user reinforced learning to help with uh, training uh, kinds of uh, our uh, new drivers and inexperienced drivers, and also try to uh, reposition the, the kinds of inexperienced drivers. And uh, this is very important. The key idea is that we want to uh, kind of learn from all these, some of the experienced drivers who have a lot of, who can get a lot of profit at the DD. And actually we were basically using uh, kinds of reinforcement based method for doing that. The AI assistant for drivers innovatively applies DD's deep reinforcement learning technology to driver dispatching while optimizing user experience and improving marketplace efficiency, it increases drivers' income by guiding them to make smart decisions. Based on deep reinforcement learning and decision theory, AI Assistant utilizes spatial temporal dynamics and deep neural networks for long-term value estimation, providing precise and effective dispatching guidance to the drivers. is now very busy. Do you want to go there? You may answer yes or no. Yes. Navigation starts. AI Assistant also maximizes the chance of the driver getting matched to a trip request, reducing vacant hours. Upon arrival at the dispatching destination, the driver stands by briefly as requests are automatically matched by the platform. Shaudi, Shaudi, please call the rider. Okay, calling the rider. When the trip is completed, the driver may disable AI assistant or accept the next task. A break reminder would be given based on service time, billing hour, and opportunity cost. This feature improves road safety and driver's income at the same time. AI Assistant empowers drivers on the platform to efficiently facilitate urban mobility and satisfy riders' needs. It optimizes the spatio-temporal distribution of supply and demand, enhancing service efficiency and social welfare. And actually, we have released some data sets collected in our platform through our GAIA program. So far, there are more than 404,000 applications from the 660 university plus university and the research institute across more than 30 um, countries. Hope that you can join us to solve many challenging problems in this topic. Thank you a lot. And, uh, and also we, we organize this kind of applied reinforced learning seminar series. Uh, if you're interested, you can uh, watch uh, some of the, uh, attend some of these seminar series. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, to uh, very interesting uh, presentation of the uh, DD story, and in particular, the work that, that you guys have been doing in, in this. Now, are you uh, working full time now for DD, or you still have your position at uh, North Carolina? I have both, but in North Carolina, I'm taking a leave of absence. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, for the for people who don't know that we were we were led to Hantu from our uh, one of our, our colleagues at the U of M Transportation Research Institute um, who uh, suggests who also worked at DD for a while 
when he took a leave of absence. And then, uh, and uh, sounds like uh, you're you're doing the same thing, only uh, in in a in a different for a different purpose, right? Yeah, well, you know, and uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's stop sharing your screen so we can see you and ask ask. Got we got a few questions for you. We don't need that. Good. Um, so uh, the descriptions that you're talking about for uh, for DD tend to be uh, uh, exclusively for uh, pa uh, driving passengers. Uh, uh, is is delivery a, a, a bigger issue for uh, for uh, DD? Are they moving more towards a uh, Delivery, or is it, uh, or is it more still uh, focused on passengers? I think uh, both side, because uh, now there's uh, the DD is you know next of three years, and uh, we, we want to at least uh, uh, increase the number of the customer side, and actually there are their goals. But the, the problem is we needed to have enough drivers to, to support that, okay? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the driving is, uh, is one, drivers is one, one kind of category of our supply side. And right. uh, I think uh, we work on both. And also we, we think about we have the e-bike and all the kinds of different new business uh, kinds of uh, uh, units because we want to increase the provide the different options to us our customers. It's not just the, by the just uh, like uh, the, the standard the kinds of the taxi type of service. And also we will try to increase the even for taxi side we wanted to have a more closer relationship with with the tax companies because we and because originally we just provided some standard service to them. But now we have the more kinds of in, more close relationship with the taxi companies. And these are companies that are separate from DD? Yeah, they are totally separate from us. Okay. It doesn't belong to us at all. We basically, the government requires basically, we are not just uh, just to uh, compete with the taxi companies. We actually need help with them in a certain way. We want the government to say this, you need to bring the new technology to this kind of the, the traditional taxi business and actually help them in a certain way. And we, we, we need to compromise with each other and basically uh, help each other in a certain way. Yeah. Are the drivers employed by DD? Uh, do no, I, no. They're independent? Yeah, I think uh, so far, I think uh, they are independent because the most of our drivers, uh, they prefer being independent. Uh, do they uh, own their own vehicles or do they rent vehicles from DD? Uh, we, they, um, majority of people, the, most of the people, I think they, they own their own vehicles. But some people, actually, the DD provides this kind of... Uh, and they now does the the we have the companies to to do these kinds of business, and they can list from us, okay. Yeah. And also we pro provide a whole series of kinds of the services afterwards because we help them to maintain to keep the the cost is low as low as possible, and uh, that's the basically they can bring down the price. Okay. okay. So that basically then. That's good for the for the for the driver too. Now, when you uh, uh, you said that you guys that you had uh, worked with a manufa automotive manufacturer, and you said that you called it a G one. What is a G one? No, the D one. D one. What is that? And actually, if you um, go to the DD's uh, website, we, we just launched a new uh, kind of vehicle called the D one car. Uh huh. This uh, is uh, of, uh, it's kind of uh, this is a coal um, Actually, we work with a, a car a vehicle company to make that car. We design the car and actually they, they produce, they make it for us. Okay. And what's what's it, it's more like uh, you, you you know that Google recently you can also uh, did, did the same thing, right? And is there we, something we, that you to the Google side. 
Yeah, is there something that's unique about the, the vehicle? Uh, yes, we, 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 we actually we designed most of the components and, uh, and also service uh, panels and also uh, kinds of computer kinds of controlling systems, everything. Right. Okay. Now, when you were talking about the, uh, the data that you guys are using for, uh, for, your, for your modeling, uh, based on your experience, what's been the most important uh, data that, you, that you've been using to do the predictions that you're doing? No, I think that's the, uh, this really depends on the, the problems uh, we try to solve. Yeah. Because if we only focus on supply and demand side, yeah. and actually we, we need to connect to um, uh, the kinds of the, uh, the first one, we need to connect to like the weather this kind of information, okay? Mm -hmm. And also the policy, the government policies, okay? Yeah. yeah. And also the, 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 and also weekends or weekdays, and, uh, and also point of interest. And uh, all of these kind of factors, and also the our company side, we have different policies where may influence the, this kind of the supply and demand. Right. And uh, we actually we connect all kinds of informations basically and try to sort out that they are causal relationship. Okay. Then we in order to achieve better prediction and accuracy. And uh, we also consider kinds of local kinds of like uh, individual levels data and also kinds of the, the group level data. And then we try to combine all the information and all the environment, we all combine all the information together for prediction. Now, when you look at all the things that you've been learning and you've really sounds like you've learned a lot by the work that you've been doing uh, with Didi, uh, what is the, the, the thing that's, that surprised you the most and that, 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 that you think has been uh, uh, the most successful for the company? Well, I think the most important things for me is that compared with my career as a professor in at UNC, uh, what I did before is I mainly doing the like a med medical imaging analysis. I'm working uh, in several diseases uh, like Alzheimer, schizophrenia, schizophrenia, I'm mainly working in the mental health related and Alzheimer's these kinds of uh, areas. I mainly use the imaging genetics things to do the, this kind of predictions. And, uh, but uh, actually, I, when I moved to Didi, I working at two, two different areas. Uh, what surprised me is I find the statistics and data analysis skills are quite important, okay? Yeah. Because the most important thing is at the end of the day, you need to solve the, these problems and uh, really can be applied to, to improve the efficiency, operational uh, efficiency for the companies. That you, you, you need to serve both the customer side the, and also driver side. Okay. And that's the reason you see that the five of the research topics I'm happy working on. And it's quite surprising me that they are all important. I have a deep connection with the statistics. That's something I, I, I really learned. And the, another thing that's important for me to learn is it's not about modeling the cell. It's about you understand the business. How does the business work? Mm -hmm. And also the most important thing is, is how do you connect to the data? Okay. And actually, the actually now I'm managing a system, uh, a, a team is basically connecting data. We try from all these uh, the kinds of uh, statistical features, and also we also do a lot of, lot of data mining to to get refined these kinds of features. And then we actually will transform all kinds of the, the data we have. We will change them from unstructured data to the, all these structured data and mm -hmm. apply it all different to the uh, problem of interest that relate to company, basically try to organize them in a systematic way and uh, to, to make them uh, produce the uh, kinds of the value for the company yeah. and uh, all our customers. I think that's the things I really kind of become a managing manager from the beginning, how to connect the data and as our prime. And I understand that the whole process, that's the most important thing I have never been done as a professor, okay? Because I never have this kind of power to do everything, everything, every step. 
Because right. then not, nobody in the agency, agency you know, the federal government won't allow me to do all the things. Right, right, right. Now, when you look at the, uh, the competitive landscape for DD, who are DD's main competitors in, in China? Uh, uh, it's hard to say. Because for the right sharing, we are still is one of the best. It's top number one. Yeah. But there's a lot of local companies and also Meituan is another kind of rider. So they, they do a lot of like uh, eating stuff, but also they try to invest into rider sharing. But uh, they, they, we have some barriers that you cannot easily get inside. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the question that we spoke about earlier, I don't know if you heard it, was this issue of uh, uh, NEVs being purchased by by a DD, and that you know there were estimates that over a period of many years, uh, DD has has purchased uh, a significant number of, of NEV vehicles. Uh, are you familiar with this? Um, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, because the reason one of the key reasons so we the the num uh, actually we we make this kind of new vehicle called the D1 vehicle. Yeah. The reason we want to own this type of vehicle and also the car was designed for us. The, the main reason we wanted to release and list these kind of cars to our drivers so can they can use it to provide the best service to our customers. Uh-huh. Okay, that's the we don't want to you know to directly borrow these kinds of the most vehicles designed for the uh, for the individual families. Uh -huh. And that's the reason we want to invest, to co-invest with all these kinds of uh, vehicle makers to, so that we can, so that we, we really do the right sharing business. We don't want to, to create a largest, one of the largest company on the uh, kinds of the taxi driving companies. We need to really focus on the car sharing, yeah. uh, these kinds of, the, otherwise this is not, it's not a high technology company. Okay. Then we move back to the traditional way of the provider, the taxi services. Not what we want. We really want to do this kind of sharing purpose. That's our mission for doing that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So the so car sharing is is one of the one of the main goals uh, of the company, uh, other than ride sharing. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, I think that's the all, that's all the questions we have for you right now. I um, want to thank you for taking the time with us today. Uh, as, a, as we talked about uh, earlier, uh, and uh, I probably the, the people who are, who are uh, probably aware of it now that we have this uh, Meet the Speakers program uh, at the end of the conference, and people have signed up to uh, meet with the speakers. Uh, uh, for uh, 15 minutes each for half an hour total uh, at the end of the conference. And for those of you who, uh, who are still online, who are, there, are, there may be some uh, openings for, uh, to meet with some of the speakers. There is a link to that in the, in the directions uh, uh, or the uh, description underneath the, the YouTube video. So please feel free to, to use that uh, as, we, as we come to uh, uh, start getting to the conclusion of our conference here. Um, and we're gonna go to our, our, our final speaker uh, of the day, uh, Chen Fu from uh, 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 Pony AI. Uh, uh, he's the director of uh, product and projects at, at Pony AI and he recognized for his implementation of large-scale technological projects and engineering solutions. He's currently leading the first public robo-taxi service in California in the U.S. Uh, his insight on the Chinese automotive industry has made him a, a key partner, key player in partnerships with global OEM manufacturers that drive uh, Pony AI's revolutionary autonomous vehicle solutions. Uh, in levering his experiences in China and the U.S., he continues to lead teams in developing the most safe and reliable autonomous vehicles that meet the challenges of modern transportation. Uh, welcome, uh, FC. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Uh, we need to turn on your video. Uh, sure. Um, 
Here you Hello, go. Everyone. All right, welcome. Um, do you want to uh, share your screen and, uh, and tell the story? Sure, for sure. Um, give me one sec, let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? I can. Cool. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a great honor to join this conference and thank you very much for inviting me uh, uh, to this uh, forum. Um, my name is Chen Fu. Uh, you can call me FC, uh, since in Chinese name, um, it will be Fu Chen. So I'm currently leading the uh, product and the project office uh, at Pony.ai. Uh, so in today's um, uh, sharing, uh, I will provide some uh, experiences that we have uh, in our uh, robotaxi services provided in both USA and China. And at the same time, I will share some of the future mobility um, services um, and also provide some of our um, observation uh, regarding to uh, the, the unique uh, chi Chinese market regarding to the high technology uh, future mobility services. Okay, for people who are not so familiar with Pony.ai, actually we are a, a startup focusing on uh, autonomous uh, driving technology. So uh, our target is try to provide our um, autonomous mobility capability everywhere uh, with our uh, most reliable and the safe, safest uh, self-driving technology. At this moment, we are a company, um, have a global uh, footprint. We have our uh, R&D center we established Actually, uh, we are a company founded uh, in the Silicon Valley uh, in uh, December 20, uh, 2016, um, South California. At the same time, uh, we have our R&D center in Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. So for people who are fam very familiar to China, you can see that all of them are the uh, big cities, metropolis uh, in, in China. So we are still uh, expanding uh, our offices uh, in multiple locations. Uh, so what we are focusing on is uh, uh, the autonomous uh, technology is uh, defined as a level five and the level uh, level four and the level five. So when we say level four and the level five autonomous uh, vehicle system, uh, we are referring to the system that uh, during the whole journey, uh, the passengers. Uh, does not need to take over uh, the uh, vehicle uh, when it's running and uh, when it's providing its uh, services. So uh, currently we already deployed our vehicles uh, equipped with our AV system in more than six different, uh, in more than six different, uh, different uh, vehicle platform. You can also see that uh, we are also working on the uh, trucks. Uh, we can also uh, make the truck uh, working, uh, driving by itself on the highway. And uh, from our side, even we are a startup, but we are providing the full stacks, which means that especially the software side, we provide all the software. You can see in uh, usually uh, for a autonomous driving system, uh, people will think that um, it will be uh, one of the automated challenge for the um, artificial intelligence technology which is true. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the autonomous vehicle system itself is a combination of not only the uh, AI technology, machine learning technology, but also a lot of um, systematic software development, um, uh, localization technology. Uh, it depends on a very important, very reliable infrastructure system, which can process huge amount of data. And at the same time, in order to make a vehicle uh, running safely, we also uh, need to employ a lot of knowledge regarding to the vehicle engineering, uh, electronic engineering, and mechanical engineering. So all these coming together provide us a reliable and smart system that can drive the vehicle automatically. So at this moment, uh, Pony is the highest valued company, AV technology company, in China. 
So um, besides, uh, as I mentioned, we have our R&D center uh, in uh, uh, Bay Area. We have been uh, running our uh, tests since um, uh, 2017. So we have, uh, we have uh, run many uh, tests in the Fremont area, uh, which is uh, our headquarter. And also at the same time, we provided uh, the very first uh, public facing robot taxi services in Irvine, uh, South California. At the same time, uh, as we have, we are also uh, leveraging uh, the uh, offices we set up in China so that we are also providing uh, uh, our uh, robot taxi service uh, in Guangzhou. And also in Beijing, we are actively testing our um, uh, vehicles, platforms uh, with the T3 permit and our robot taxi permits. Um, in Shanghai, we're also preparing to launch a larger scale uh, robot taxi fleet uh, in later this year. So uh, from here, you can see that actually we are carrying our operation in both USA and China. So um, in the coming, uh, in the next minute, uh, 10 minutes, uh, I will maybe show, show you something about the robo taxi because when people say, oh, we are talking about autonomous driving, how does it look uh, on the public street? How a, uh, a self-driving vehicle behave uh, in, in the, uh, in the public street, in the in the normal driving scenarios. So uh, let me share a uh, video with you so that uh, we can take a look into what we will look into is that how the vehicle works in uh, USA uh, USA um, uh, public road. And the most interesting thing is that how uh, the Chinese uh, public road looks like and how should our vehicle work in such kind of a more challenging environment. Okay, so this is a one of the huge intersection we can see in Beijing. Whatever you are seeing that our vehicle is driving by itself and in this intersection, you can see it's pretty busy and you can almost see everything, right? So uh, our vehicle need to keep a close eye with, uh, to the environment, surrounding environment with all the sensors it has. And at the same time, it need to do multiple calculations, make a lot of judgment uh, in between itself and all the surrounding uh, cyclists, uh, pedestrians, vehicles to make sure that our vehicle is driving like a human and also uh, in a very safe way. So this is a very typical scenario you will see every day uh, in Beijing. And uh, like a human, when we are driving, sometimes we need to change the lane a lot for a, uh, a vehicle to do it. Sometimes it's not an easy job. It's one of the very, very challenging job. You can see that for this case, we cancel the lane changing because there is a vehicle rushing up from behind. And at the same time, we need to protect the people, the J worker who is uh, working on the side so that we are taking care of all the objects. And that this is one of the uh, scenario that um, our vehicle is trying to uh, arrive into a intersection and it, it smartly choose a most uh, suitable sweet spot for itself so that it can move forward very smoothly. Uh, with these actions, you will see in the common lane change and moving on, you will see that the vehicle is just behaving like a human. I think one of the vehicle on the right, the driver might be a little bit late um, in starting up. Raining is another very challenging scenario in our autonomous driving technology. Usually uh, during the raining day, people will have a higher uh, demanding for the robot, uh, the taxi services. Uh, but how to make sure our system is working stable, uh, working very stable in a raining uh, day when you don't have very clear view on the street and you have a lot, a lot of noises um, produced by the water. In China, especially in Guangzhou, uh, during the summertime, it rains a lot. So that if 
uh, in order to make sure our vehicle can still work in multiple uh, climates, uh, we spend quite a lot of time to take the challenges and it works out pretty well. It works out pretty well. So this, all this you can see that the vehicle is uh, uh, managing its relationship uh, with all the other uh, vehicles in a very proper way. Pedestrians are another uh, challenges, in, especially in China. So in China, uh, we will see many different scenarios just like this. The pedestrian is not even looking into the road and he is actually working on the, uh, on the main street. So that uh, this is one of the beauty of our solution uh, that we always take care uh, of the uh, people on the road. We care about their safety. The kids are always full of energy. Sometimes they just forget about where they are, but our system can always uh, find out their behaviors and take the very safe decisions to protect those lovely kids. Okay, so I think uh, by uh, watching this video, uh, I think uh, 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 we provide you a uh, rough idea about how it looks uh, in, in, in China public roads. So if we come back to our slides, let me see. Um, yeah. Okay. So in the coming slides, uh, uh, I will share you some um, robot taxi services we have launched uh, in US and uh, China. Considering some of the data are a little bit sensitive in China. So before I jump into China services, I will provide you some of the data we have. Uh, from the robotaxi services we provided uh, to the public uh, in Irvine. So in Irvine, uh, we set up a, uh, a fleet um, so that we are providing the robotaxi services on demand hailing services uh, from uh, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So um, for each vehicle, uh, we have uh, more than 15 rides per day. And uh, uh, since uh, the launch in uh, November 2019, we have accomplished more than 100,000 miles autonomous driving uh, services. So um, uh, we have, we, based on the feedback, um, we can see that we have a lot of a strong user engagement. Our vehicle is always uh, on the way to pick up uh, a pedestrian of a passenger or uh, on the way to sending a passenger to the destination. So uh, many users, they are very frequent user. From that, you can see that the, the people, our people, our, our passenger and the users, they uh, embrace the technology. Uh, they enjoy the services very much. And we can see the service itself is growing very fast uh, since we launched it. So, and a lot of them, they are actually uh, spread out. We didn't do too many marketing. Actually, there are a lot of uh, uh, users. They are sharing the experiences. Uh, they take videos, uh, post it on their Twitters and the YouTubes so that they just uh, uh, introduce their friends to this, uh, the services so that it grows very fast. It grows very fast. And also in beginning of this year in, uh, uh, in, uh, March, April, unfortunately, we hit the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. At that time, uh, we have to uh, pause our um, uh, robotaxi services. But since our vehicle can drive everywhere so that we leverage our fleet to provide our last mile auto, auto uh, delivery system, um, we uh, cooperate with a e-commerce company so that at, uh, we can provide um, Irvine area customers with one day uh, deliver for all their uh, groceries, uh, foods they purchased online. So this is the scale uh, that we have in our, uh, in our services. So uh, overall, the service, uh, the, the users who use our services covers a lot. We start with a UCI, our uh, college students, we provide them uh, a lot of services in between their uh, campuses and the, uh, 
campuses and their commute to, to the to to study uh, with their uh, apartments. And then later on, we expand the services to a lot of uh, um, people uh, who work in the CBD center and uh, provide them a lot of a commute in between their apartment, their offices, the offices to the shopping mall because a lot of people take our vehicle for their lunch outside the office. So this is a very, very successful uh, uh, services we provided. Uh, it's not only uh, showed that our system is mature uh, enough to provide a public facing services. At the same time, we also collect a lot of data to understand the user pattern and our system is uh, keep growing up uh, to be more adaptive to see how to do dynamic dispatching, how to adapt to the system capacity to support our users' needs, how to improve the user experiences by uh, improvement of the algorithm, how to improve the ex experiences to make them feel very comfortable and uh, very safe when they're sitting inside a vehicle. So that's a lot of uh, um, feedback coming from our uh, passengers. They say that, um, yeah, it's just like a human driven uh, vehicle services and it's, and it's so convenient. So based on these kind of in, in, uh, experiences, uh, actually, uh, we are, excuse me, let me see, there are some uh, hiccups. Yeah, so uh, we also, um, I lost my mouse. Uh, some problem with the, with my, uh, yeah, okay, so, Based on that services, I think I gave everyone a rough idea about how it works because it's easier for people to understand how the taxi services running in the uh, USA. So actually at the same time, we are providing the similar services in China. In China, we are also, when we design our uh, serving area, we also keep in mind that we want to provide a very meaningful robot taxi services. So that uh, when we are selecting the area, we'll select a area that includes a lot of uh, many different uh, meaningful um, destinations. From here, what you can see is that we pick up a area uh, that include government offices, include our uh, schools, include the shopping malls, metro station. Metro station is a very important destination in China because people rely on metro uh, quite a lot for their commute. Uh, and also a lot of a shopping, dining complex, even uh, some uh, um, bus, uh, bus station terminal and the hotels. So that we have been running this kind of services continuously for about uh, two years. And then we have a area covered about 200 uh, square kilometers. Uh, we, have, we, can achieve, we have a larger uh, fleet uh, in China. We are finishing, uh, we, we, we produce uh, in this area, uh, we deploy the more than 200 uh, pick up and the drop off point. So pick up drop off is a very con uh, drop off point is a very important concept in China because in most of the city they are pretty well uh, designed and very strictly uh, managed. So it it usually does not allow you to drop off a uh, passenger anywhere considering the safety on the public roads. So that uh, there are a lot of concept that they will have a designate point that for you to pick up and drop off drop off the passengers to make sure that uh, uh, the traffic is not impacted and uh, uh, it's safe for both uh, the vehicle, the passenger and all the vehicles surrounding. So this is a very typical uh, dense urban uh, area, which is also another challenging uh, to the technology of our uh, robo taxi vehicles. Um, so, since this uh, forum is, is talking about the China uh, automotive, so that uh, based on our uh, operation and the service experiences we had in both USA and China, uh, we'd like to share some of the uh, insights about the future uh, of the smart mobility in China, uh, just for everyone's reference. So first of all, what we can see is that uh, in China, uh, the transportation infrastructure is um, 
developed in a very fast pace. So you can see that uh, uh, the electronic vehicle, um, the market share is picking up. You see uh, many vendors, they are providing pure EV in China and the uh, customer, uh, they like this kind of model very much. We have a lot of uh, facilities improved. The facilities including the, 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 the road, public road, uh, the traffic lights, uh, all the protective um, facilities, uh, smart uh, crosswalk. So the China uh, the city and the government, the officers in the city and the government, they, they do a lot of uh, future proof of planning to improve uh, the uh, infrastructure and the facilities in the public uh, transportation. So this is a one of the trends and the China is uh, really good at that part, especially uh, that, that you can see a lot in those uh, well-developed uh, uh, metropolis and the big cities. Uh, on the other hand, I think, uh, since we are talking about a lot of a new technology, uh, so the attitude from the government towards the new technology is super important. What are we can, we are very glad to see that we have very supportive government from China, from multiple regions, different cities, so that uh, uh, they are proactively making uh, the policies uh, and the regulations, which is, helping to uh, facilitate all the new technology tests and the deployment in different areas. So we can see that they are very determined, determined to uh, move towards a, a smarter transportation and that they are trying to make the law, the regulation more mature so that uh, all the technology services can be developed and deployed in the very well-defined framework. So, and also when we talk about the uh, future mobility, definitely the user of China will be a very important group that we need to work with. Actually, uh, what, what we can see that for the chi Chinese users, they are very open to the new technology. In the past 10 years, many, chi uh, many uh, high-tech technology and internet services, they are all long launched successfully and the well used uh, in China. Most of them become the largest market in the world. So we can also see in our, from our uh, services provided to the public, we can also see that the people are very open to the new technology and that they are so excited for those autonomous driving services uh, so that we can see in the future more and more people get used to this technology and that they will, they will take more uh, of the services as just uh, what they are having nowadays uh, provided by uh, uh, the, the human driver. So of course, at the same time, we also believe that uh, in our, uh, with our um, algorithm, with our high efficiency dispatching uh, uh, system, the autonomous driving itself can uh, yield a very high efficiency in energy and uh, reduce a lot of uh, carbon emission because we can have the optimized routing planning. Uh, we can maximize the uh, uh, ride sharing by our algorithm, and uh, we can minimize the wandering time for a vehicle in the street. So, uh, and also at the same time, the electronic vehicle and uh, autonomous technology, uh, they complement to each other. Most of the, uh, our solution, they works, per, uh, they works perfectly. Uh, on a, a pure electronic vehicle. Uh, considering we have a sensors, we have a computation systems uh, that they all require uh, uh, electronic, uh, electricity power. So that uh, this is a perfect combination. The technology and the uh, EV trend, they, they merge and they, uh, they, they work together perfectly for the future. Um, yeah, I think uh, that is a sum uh, of our experiences. Uh, we had in both US China regarding to the autonomous driving technology, uh, the robo taxi services uh, that we can share uh, with all of you today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, FC. Uh, very nice uh, description and story about what, what you've been doing at, at, uh, at Pony. Um, got some good questions for you. Sure. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, one of the first one that has to do with your uh, technology stack. Uh, what, what in your view makes the, your technology stack unique? So I think uh, for Pony.ai, uh, we designed the system from very bottom line uh, so that we even design the uh, system by ourselves instead of employ a mature robot, ro robotic uh, operating system or some other system, we build it from scratch. So that based on the understanding of the infrastructure and the in-house build system, we can uh, maximize the system's performance and the reliability. We have a lot of uh, um, room uh, that uh, we can under our own control, which can help us to push the system to the maximum performance and make the system super reliable in many different situations. Are you using uh, your own sensors uh, and uh, 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 cameras, uh, radar, LIDAR, or are you buying those from suppliers? Yeah, we use a combination. We have in-house sensors built up by ourselves. And all, at the same time, we are also leveraging the sensor industry and we always use the most advanced and reliable system from the market. So, so we put them together and integrate them uh, seamlessly to provide an end-to-end -end solution. Are, they, are, are the suppliers uh, uh, Chinese, uh, US, uh, European uh, combination of all those? It's a combination of everywhere. It's a combination of everywhere because uh, many uh, different vendors, they have their own unique uh, competence and the technology advantages so that we are uh, taking, uh, as I said, we, we carefully pick uh, the vendor of the sensor and they are coming from everywhere. Okay. Um, we're, pretty, uh, we're pretty familiar with the autonomous vehicle story in the US, not so much about China. Uh, mm -hmm. Who are your competitors in, in China? Well, in China, we have uh, multiple competitors. Uh, if we categorize them, some of them, they are internet uh, companies like uh, Alibaba and the Meituan. Um, some of them, they work on the uh, uh, taxi services um, and uh, um, ride sharing uh, services like Didi. Uh, like uh, Dita, they, they, they are also working on that. And also we, uh, in China, there are some other uh, startups uh, who works on uh, autonomous driving uh, technology, like a WeRide, AutoX, yeah. Okay, so it's, there's a variety of, uh, uh, sounds like small players and big players, a combination of. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, now in, in the US, one of the things that they talk about uh, when they talk about uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, they also talk about connected vehicles uh, as, a, as a combination piece. Yes. So that you can see a little farther down the road than your sensors can, can, can do, right? Mm -hmm. um, are you incorporating the, uh, I know in the US, we re really don't have the infrastructure set up <laughs> to do as much of that as, as, as needs to be done. Is, that, is it any different in China? Yes, I think this is exa exactly um, echo to the uh, very first point I mentioned, the, uh, the infrastructure uh, of, the, of the transportation. In the Chinese government, they tried uh, very hard to move towards this direction. When we talk about the uh, interconnected vehicles, we always talk about a V2X, right? A vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to a lot of other things. So in China, uh, there are many cities they are trying to establish such kind of infrastructure. There are a lot of a pilot project launched by different, different uh, cities, locations. I believe from that perspective, the smart infrastructure, the advanced transportation uh, system um, in China, it will, they will be uh, deployed sooner and quicker. Uh -huh. Okay, very good. Um, I'm assuming, uh, well, in the U.S., you still need to have a safety driver uh, in your testing. Is that true for China as well? I think uh, uh, whether you have a uh, safety driver, it will rely on two main factors. One is how mature your technology is. Do you feel it's safe to have the vehicle running in the, on the public street? But on the other hand, there are also regulation. Both USA and the China government, they have very strict regulation because they need to, in the US it's a DMV, 
who will review all your uh, application to see if you want to take out the driver, you will go through a uh, application permit review. In China, it's a similar, but the unique thing is that in China, uh, the regulation is uh, done by local government. So uh, in, from that perspective, you will see that uh, uh, in some of the city, the government open for a driverless test to permit. Wow. Okay. Some of the city, they will say, mm, we will keep that uh, for a while and we will open to maybe next year. So you will see different uh, progresses and different regulations uh, in China because it's not a unified rule. Some of the city, they are very uh, open, uh, supportive to the new technology. So they will take more um, uh, open-minded and provide more uh, convenience and the trust of the uh, technology more. Some of the city, they will choose a very conservative way, uh, but they want to make sure all your tests are carried out carefully uh, with safety. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good. Um, now, the uh, uh, coming from Michigan, as I am, uh, we, uh, we deal with a, 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 an issue that you, you have not really seen very much of, and that's snow. And yeah. uh, have you been doing any testing in any snow, uh, snow areas? Yes, actually we did. Um, as our vehicle is supposed to um, be running global wise so that uh, different climates are one of the challenges we are talking about. So for example, when we are having our test in Beijing, Beijing is a is a, a north of uh, in North China, so that right. they, they right. snowed a lot. So yeah, snow, windy, uh, heavy rain, they are all kind of a challenges that we are uh, dealing with uh, in our uh, whole system development. All right, so much so much of the technology re uh, relies on uh, being able to see the lines on the road and 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 have these markers to keep your vehicle. Uh, in, in a lane uh, and, and in a safe driving in a safe way. Uh, what, what kind of, uh, how is your, how are your algorithms dealing, managing that, that complex situation where you really can't, may not be able to see everything on the, on the road itself that you like? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Actually, uh, every time people ask that a question, I, I will be very happy to, uh, show the beauty of the autonomous driving technology. Because when we talk about autonomous driving technology, we are using multiple sensors. Mm -hmm. Different sensors, they have different performance and they are complemented to each other. Uh, when we say, uh, if we compare to human, usually we only use our uh, eyes and ears to observe mm -hmm. the surroundings. And sometimes, uh, like me, I don't have very good eyesight. <laughs> uh, but uh, for our vehicle, uh, they are very stable because they have a multiple sensors. So they can see hundreds of meters away. Um, and the, some of them work perfectly. Even you have a very heavy ring, uh, the, the sum of the uh, laser uh, sensor, they can see through. And in the very dark environment, uh, our system is not a problem. Some of the camera, they can still see very clear uh, in very dark environment. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, our technology will combine all the different data from multiple sources, which means that we always utilize all the data from each sensor, which can maximize the information we can obtain from the road, which provide a more informative input for the vehicle to make judgment. Okay, very good, thank you. Now. Uh... We have uh, one of our colleagues here, uh, uh, Hong Tu, uh, working with uh, Didi, and, and, and he has his uh, robo taxi. Do you have a robo taxi fleet as well? Hong Tu? Do you have a, a robo taxi fleet as well? Robo taxi fleet? Yeah, uh, do you have an do you have an autonomous vehicle program? Yes, we do. You do. Uh, yeah. And uh, and do you have vehicles uh, being tested right now? Yes, we have. We have both in uh, in China and also in the U.S. Ah, um, and uh, it sounds like it's a sounds like the dispatching program, the the program that you have been working on, that is. Uh, so much more advanced. There might be some uh, 
linkages that you might want to uh, might want to talk to uh, FC about, or FC should want to talk to you about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, could be. Yeah, sure. Because uh, we are, uh, he's more uh, technical side. I'm more working on this kind of customer side. Right, right. And then uh, actually, the, we we have the automotive the driving branch unit. Basically, we we, we do all the similar things, but. Uh, is a different, we connect uh, more in you know, different angles. And also because we are uh, kinds of ride sharing company, we have a connect to the data related to our kinds of business. Right, right, exactly. Um, let's see, uh, here's a comment from somebody uh, for UFC. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you comment on the integration of other transportation systems? Uh, buses, trams, local train services. Okay, so um, yeah, I think the question is if we are uh, capable to turn the, uh, uh, the traditional uh, transportation system into a smart system, is that right. a question? Right. Yeah, as a, yeah, for intermodal uh, transportation systems, right? Sure. I think first of all, the transportation system itself is a uh, system. When we say it's a system, we need to collect them all together. As I mentioned in my previous um, slides, so for example, in China, connected to a metro uh, station is a very important because for some of the long distance uh, transportation, the metro system give you faster uh, transportation uh, uh, method. But in the last mile, when they get out of the metro, uh, they need to go to a destination, then the taxi services, robot taxi services is a very good uh, complement services. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if we are talking about, uh, can we make a, a bus uh, drive by itself automatically? Actually, the answer is definitely yes. Technically, to turn a bus into an auto uh, driving system is way easier comparing to turning a uh, normal vehicle into a robo taxi services because the bus usually have a low speed and the bus usually goes to the fixed routes. So uh, all the scenarios is very predictable. So technically, yes, I think in the future, since we are now working on the, uh, uh, the sedan, the SUV, we are also working on truck. Uh, I think uh, all the, uh, technically uh, the solution is ac applicable uh, to uh, multiple uh, vehicle platforms, including bus. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time today to give us an insight and on, on, on your company. Uh, congratulations on your uh, your relationship with Toyota and, and FAW that just got announced recently. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Nice fun. New, nice new funding sources. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, Hong Tu, I want to thank you for for sharing your uh, insights about the about uh, DD. I think you you provided some great information about the work that you're doing and and how it's going to uh, apply to the uh, DD platform. Uh, uh, Shanjun, I want to thank you again for uh, participating today about uh, giving your insights on on uh, your research your research on uh, on kind of applied economics. Um, uh, it was a very interesting talk, and I think that the uh, I think our audience really uh, really learned a lot today in terms of what's going on in terms uh, uh, within China for the specific areas that you guys are focusing on. Uh, I you, think Bruce. that's going to be it for today. Uh, our next conference is going to be uh, on February twenty fourth. Uh, uh, it has the uh, title of uh, "Never uh, Never Let a an Issue." Uh, 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 never let, what is, how does it go? Never let a, uh, uh, a well, in this case, a pandemic, <laughs> never, never let a crisis go to waste. So what are some of the things that you can do in a crisis situation? And in this case, we're looking at new mobility and how new mobility will be affected by uh, the pandemic and what kinds of things are getting slowed down and what kinds of things are actually speeding up because of, of the pandemic uh, in terms of new mobility and automated vehicles and ride sharing are all part of that story as well. So uh, we'll be uh, interested to, to hear from our, our, our next set of speakers in February about this topic. So again, thank you all very much and uh, we'll see you uh, in February. Take care. <laughs>